Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our first committee of the whole meeting for the fall uh, post-summer break. Nice to see everybody. I uh, just want to start the meeting by acknowledging that we're having this meeting on the traditional territory of the Coast and Strait Salish people, specifically the lekwungen speaking people known today as the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nation, and that these uh, their connections to these lands continue to this day. I also just want to point out to everybody that uh, our uh, meeting today will be live streamed and the video will be archived for future viewing as well online. Uh, if you are watching this at home, uh, we are gathered today as a committee of the whole. Uh, so we're not making decisions tonight, but we're considering uh, various uh, presentations and applications and making recommendations back to council. Um, as a committee of the whole, we do invite the public to participate uh, on the agenda items where we're making decisions or where we're making recommendations. So um, with that, we are actually going to uh, uh, I'll make a call at the beginning of each section, uh, and uh, you can call into the phone number at 250-598-3311. I'll repeat that number every time, um, and that will be the number of people at home wish to comment uh, on any of the items uh, on the agenda this evening, um, and those will go through one by one. Uh, to start off with, uh, uh, we're going to welcome the South Island Prosperity Partnership, first of a number of, quite a large number of items on the agenda today, so we'll try and get through these fairly expediously. Um, uh, and with that, uh, I will welcome Dallas. And I, of course, forgotten your last name already. <laughs> Dallas, as I'm sitting here um, from the South Island Prosperity Partnership. And uh, welcome. What's that? Business, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's Icelandic, so we don't know how it's pronounced either. <laughs> um, I think Emily's actually on the call, uh, ready to, to actually lead the presentation. This is actually her deck, and she, she couldn't make it this evening. So I'm, I'm here to uh, work the slides and be part of the Q&A if there are any. And I think Emily uh, should be calling in if she's on. Uh, Ms. Hopkins, is uh, is the phone up and running and at this point? Emily, are you in the meeting here? She says she's on mute. Uh, if just... you hit star six, that will unmute you. Hi, everyone. Okay. Well, and uh, welcome to the meeting. Thank you very much for having me. I'm uh, I'm sorry, I can't be there in person. Um, I, one of my, um, my, my mother actually is, is uh, having some health issues, so we can't, we're um, keeping her supported in our, within our bubble. So I um, appreciate you um, making the accommodation here for us tonight. Um, first of all, um, I, uh, can I just jump in right now? Sorry, it did cut out a little bit when, I, when you introduced me. Uh, yes, yeah, go ahead and jump in, Emily. Uh, this is Ms. DeRosenroll from uh, Southern Empire Prosperity Partnership. Uh, the, is, I think your title is your CEO uh, of the partnership uh, and presenting. Uh, if anybody's watching at home, you can follow along your presentation that's been attached uh, in the agenda package. So uh, go ahead, uh, Ms. Ms. DeRosenroll. Okay, thank you so much. And I, I believe Dallas Gislason um, should be right there with the, the slide deck. And uh, I'm assuming I'm starting on slide one. So uh, first of all, uh, before I get going, I'm calling in from Esquimalt um, this evening. And I'd just like to acknowledge that I live and work on the traditional lands of the Lekwungen people, also known as the Songhees and Esquimalt Nations. Um, so thank you so much for having um, uh, me here uh, virtually, I suppose, and, and Dallas here in person, and the opportunity to speak with you about our first four years um, of the South Island Prosperity Partnership and to discuss some of the next steps of our organization's future. So slide two. Uh, who is SIP? As you know, SIP is an alliance of over 65 public and private sector partners across Greater Victoria, and these include 11 local governments, nine First Nations, three post-secondary institutions, nine industry associations and nonprofits, and over 30 major employers. So the District of Oak Bay is one of our founding municipal members, and we are extremely grateful um, about the commitment that you've demonstrated um, in the, the region's economic future. So thank you very much for that. Third slide, our mission. SIP facilitates and promotes the development of a strong, resilient, inclusive, and diversified economy. Um, and like you, we believe that the economy is for everyone, and we're committed to strengthening our economy in balance with our values and envir the environment, our people, and culture. Next slide. So four years and counting. Um, SIP has been in existence now since 2016, and as we um, approach our fifth year anniversary, uh, to ensure that we're still meeting and exceeding the needs and values of our members, we initiated an organizational review 
to examine the current strengths and areas of future focus with an independent evaluator. This work's been overseen by an organizational review committee. The independent evaluator conducted 22 surveys and 19 stakeholder interviews, and the full results will be presented to you at this upcoming AGM in September. So, so far, there seems to be the general perception that, uh, first of all, SIP is making progress and achieving impact in supporting economic development and awareness in the region. Two, there is a need for economic development at a regional level, coordination and collaboration, and that SIP is effectively filling this role. And three, economic development is a long-term proposition, and many significant outcomes will be measurable 10 years or more out in the future. Next slide. So I'd like to invite you all to this year's AGM. Um, usually it's members only, but this year, um, given that it's the end of a five-year period, um, and we'll have the opportunity here from the organizational reviewer, from Kim Thoreau, um, we'd like to invite everybody. So it's a digital event, um, and, I, and I hope you can all make it. Next uh, slide here. So we began with 29 members and have more than doubled that now to uh, 66 members. And slide seven. Uh, we believe that our effectiveness lies in the diversity of our members. So we have the most diverse regional economic development model in all of Canada that we've ever come across. And in fact, we recently won the gold medal for excellence from the International Economic Development Council for this collaborative governance model. And that's, of course, thanks to your leadership um, and others like you in the, in the first, uh, first few years of our existence. Okay, next slide. Um, Oak Bay and the regional economy. So Oak Bay is not a major commercial center, but of course its economy is strongly tied to the full metropolis, metropolitan, I can't say that, metro region. Um, one of the guiding principles um, used by the founding members of SIP it was the, the fundamental belief that our economy is deeply intertwined and integrated. And so we can show you here, this is um, just a working, uh, working slide which we're developing um, more, um, more examples like this that we can overlay on top of each other. But it just gives an example of how, I think a nice visual example of how our economy works and where people live is very different from where they derive their income. So um, of course in Oak Bay, the majority, vast, vast majority of um, the workforce works outside of Oak Bay. Um, and is lucky enough to call it Bay its home. So you can see here just an example um, by mapping out uh, one of SIP members, CGI, and you can sort of see how really an economy is uh, like a big spider web of interdependencies. Next slide, please. So uh, purpose as defined by our members, our purpose was enshrined in our constitution and came directly from consultation with our members. And I'm not going to read them directly here uh, because we're going to go over them very quickly uh, one by one and talk about some of the things that we've done in those areas. So purpose one, diversify and strengthen the regional economy, promote better employment opportunities, and increase quality of life for citizens of the region. Slide, uh, next slide, 11. Uh, new business. So to this end, SIP attracts new companies in targeted sectors in order to create new high quality jobs and contribute positively to the diversity and resilience of our economy. So to date, we have attracted seven new businesses and our rate of attraction is increasingly growing and, and it's doing that increasingly rapidly. Um, that's because on average, it, it does take seven to 24 months of working with a company to facilitate a relocation. So that would mean that you would, you'd start to see increasingly more and more, um, more and more um, progress in this area. Next slide, please. Um, job growth. So another measure that we track is job growth through the, our business attraction efforts and our trade accelerator clients. So to date, we have developed, um, we have helped create 175 direct new jobs. <laughs> and this will fall below our original forecast um, uh, goal of 500 but it doesn't consider induced jobs, which will equal 718 additional jobs to date. So the total value of these jobs in combined salaries is over 35 million, or sorry, yes, 35 million um, per year, creating significant demand for other sectors as well, like retail, restaurants, professional services, real estate, and construction. So it's worth a quick note that as of last year, 75% of our members surveyed 
cited a shortage of high-skilled labor as being their number one top concern for impeding growth, and they've reported chronic labor shortages equal to 4% of the total workforce. So simply put, job creation is quite challenging with a constricted labor market like ours, um, as it was until early 2020. And, and of course, things are, are changing now, but they won't, won't take long to go back to um, tight labor conditions again. Um, we can talk more if you're interested in, in sort of some of our um, issues right now, which are a little bit different with the pandemic. Right, next slide, please. So quality over quantity. This is another side of the, the other side of the coin, rather. Um, we received clear direction from our members to focus on growing good jobs over the living wage. So that means over 40,300 a, 40, a year as of 2019. Um, the average salary of the jobs in our previous slide was on average $86,900 a year. Um, so we also work hard to establish a, a very strong fit with our community. Uh, and I can give you a, an example, such as Daytown is a Brazilian software company that for the past 10 years in a row has received best place to work in South America certification. And they began by bringing in 17 Brazilian employees and their families to Canada because their work culture is such a strong component of their business. Um, and they do intend to gradually grow to over 100 people by hiring locally. So they're really a shining example of the wonderful community integration that we have and, and um, uh, they even have formed a strong Portuguese speaking community around a local Portuguese church and they meet there every week. Um, it sounds cliche but literally to play soccer and have a barbecue um, and I soon talk about how cold that, that first snow felt. I, I don't know if you can see that photo on slide 13 but, but that was uh, the first time they experienced snow and then sent us that um, selfie pic. Okay now uh, next slide please. So our second purpose is raise the profile of Southern Vancouver Island as a location of choice for new business endeavors. Next slide. Each year we study the local economy to see how we stand out nationally and globally. We've developed a business attraction package that highlights and brands our signature strengths and, the market, and markets our regions to companies in, in other areas like Western USA, Brazil, South Ontario and Alberta. So the Prosperity Index, in order to understand our strengths and vulnerabilities, for the past three years, we have published something called the Prosperity Index. This is a sister publication to Victoria Foundation's Vital Signs. Um, and another complementary piece of work is the Business of Cities project, which we will um, be releasing in late November, and that adds a strong qualitative side to the more quantitatively focused Prosperity Index your monthly recovery dashboard. We recently began to publish a complement to the Prosperity Index uh, called the Monthly Recovery Dashboard to be able to track and measure how we emerge from this recession. So the purpose is to support businesses and, and sectors, but also to give the public confidence that, as, that we are beginning to recover and that we can emerge stronger from the post-pandemic. So purpose three, we work collaboratively with First Nations on the South Island to achieve Indigenous economic reconciliation. This is an area where we've actually surpassed our initial expectations, uh, but certainly have learned a tremendous amount in the process. So as you can see, SIP began um, with two First Nation communities and today have nine First Nation communities as our members. Slide 20. Um, the indigenous economy. I'll just briefly highlight a few um, examples here. So with our partners, we created Indigenous Connect, a monthly entrepreneur roundtable. Um, we've also co-hosted the first Indigenous Prosperity Gathering last year, which drew together the South Island nations for the first time ever um, to discuss economic development topics. So SIP was instrumental in getting the funding required to create the Songhees Innovation Centre, which is a co-working space and incubator for Indigenous entrepreneurs and freelancers. And as you can see in this graph, it's been growing year over year. Purpose four, getting close to the end. Of, I know it's late for everybody here. So purpose four is maximizing federal and provincial funding for regional economic development. And to date, we've been awarded with over a million dollars in funding from the federal and provincial governments for economic development and over 800,000 in direct investment in SIP from non-governmental sources. 
and we anticipate more in the coming years, specifically in relation to our rising economy work. Smart City. So Canada's Smart Cities Challenge was an opportunity for Greater Victoria to get on Canada's radar as an economic powerhouse and national innovator. And we received a $250,000 grant for this, and we were a finalist um, in Canada's uh, cities that were poised to win $10 million for our smart mobility proposal. And although we didn't get the final prize, this proposal remains relevant and, and projects within it will likely be strong candidates for stimulus funding, um, which we'll know more about um, by in the coming months, about a month. So last month, the IMF said the crisis presents an opportunity to accelerate the shift to a more productive, sustainable, and equitable growth through investments in new green and smart digital technologies, as well as wider social safety nets. So I just bring that up to say that, that smart cities is, a, is, a, is an economic development concept that will remain uh, very much in play through the recovery efforts, and we're, we're going to see a lot more coming from the Government of Canada on that to, to encourage more um, of this kind of recovery. Um, next slide, please. So a rising economy task force. So since the pandemic hit, SIP has moved quickly to launch the rising economy task force to coordinate a strong local response to the economic crisis. And the task force is the largest coordinated industry-led recovery effort in BC. And our goal is to establish a regional plan to accelerate recovery efforts with a focus on inclusion, sustainability, and resilience. So we have over 120 stakeholders who've been involved. Um, and including, and we're very fortunate to have Hazel on our, on our partners committee. Um, and so this is also connected to 11 sector-driven committees um, that were struck in order to provide uh, practical recommendations on how to move the needle on our recovery over the next 18 months. So progress is the next slide. Um, as I said, there's over 120 stakeholders. This is created, we've led to, to 10 committee reports um, this is look, we've looked at over 50 meetings and workshops to get there, um, over 250 industry surveys. Uh, this has resulted in 39 recommendations um, and uh, nine major recovery themes, which will be the pillars of our economic recovery strategy. Um, in terms of immediate next steps, we're certainly not, not waiting for just sort of reports, but we're looking at what are some of the quick wins, the advocacy priorities, for the region and uh, partnership opportunities that can be acted on right away. Um, and then the regional recovery strategy uh, will be released during Rising Economy Week in November. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. Okay, so traction. This is just an example of some of the things that have already come out of this committee work. Um, and I just want to give you a sample. So one is the COVID Safe Verification app in partnership with the BC government um, as well as retail services and restaurants committee. Uh, and this allows you to go to, a, let's say, a restaurant or a store and be able to scan a QR code, which will later become an app, um, and allow us to see whether or not the establishment is compliant and how they're doing in terms of um, complying with their um, the requirements to be more pandemic-proofed under the, the PHO requirements. So it's a way to kind of create more confidence of consumers in going um, into the local establishment. That, that's one project, um, and it was directly um, developed. It'll be rolled out for the whole province, but it was developed with our with our local committee, in particular the restaurant sector. Um, micro credential training is another one. Uh, micro credential training is a fancy way to say how do we get people to be skilled, um, upskilled, reskilled faster. So if they've lost a job in one sector. They can be reskilled in three months as opposed to three years. Um, so we've done our first one now with um, digital marketing uh, uh, focus with Alacrity Foundation and BC government. And we've also partnered now with all of the post-secondary institutions to develop collaborative uh, sort of menu-based uh, other credentials, micro-credentials, uh, to be able to help people sort of re, uh, uh, reconnect with a different part of the economy. Um, Ocean Futures Innovation Hub is a business case that we're developing right now through the uh, Ocean Ms. Marine Rosen. Committee, uh, the Association of BC Marine Industries, the federal mm -hmm. government, and the City of Victoria, who have also put in some funding. Um, and we've received $100,000 in funding from the federal government for shovel-worthy proposals that come from the task force's recommendations. 
Ms. Rosenroll, I just want to point out we're yeah. just we've completed our sort of time allocation for the presentation. Can I just ask you to wrap it up and we can get to a couple of questions before we move on? Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry, Thank I thought you. I had fifteen minutes. Is it not? We we're over we're about we're about seventeen minutes into the fifteen minutes allocated. Okay, okay, I apologize. Um so I'll skip to uh rising economy week for, for one second, Alice. Okay, and so I'd like to just note that if you sign up here on a Rising Economy Week, we'll be able to um, send you more information, but there's a lot of um, exciting keynotes and panels and so forth that are um, going to be taking place that week. Um, and then I'm going to skip right through to um, to the SIP team. Let's go to SIP, SIP team, as, which is 37. So my apologies. You're the first of all of our presentations, <laughs> and, and it's clearly way too way too much information. Um, so the, I do want to point out, though, that we have a pretty small team for, and obviously a busy group of us here. So um, we have uh, five of us on the team and some occasional contractors. Um, and so you've got Dallas there in front of you, and, and I'm missing from the picture, but wish I could be there. And then the last slide I will show you is our five-year renewed funding request. Um, and so what I'd like just to highlight here is we were due to update the model, the funding model, based on, um, uh, because it was based on the 2016, uh, the 2011 census, and now it's updated to take into consideration the 2016 uh, census and the 2018 tax blend. Um, but what we've done, uh, just to acknowledge the difficulty of the year, um, we're moving into is kept the, 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 the amount the same, so not increasing it next year. Um, and then after that, introducing a 2.5% increase over year to year. Um, and we're hoping, we've been talking to a lot of municipalities, we're hoping to, to look to get a five-year funding contribution um, to be able to have uh, some, some stability and predictability the next five years as we've got a, a lot, to, lot on our plate when we're looking at the recovery work. Um, and, other, and other projects as well. So thank you all so much for your time. We're extremely grateful for your support and I apologize for going over. No worries, thank you for your presentation. I know it's, uh, it's, it, it always seems like a lot of time, uh, but it's not. So thank you for, your, uh, for, for wrapping it up. Uh, we do have the full presentation, however, so uh, we, we do have all the data and information. Um, and we're not making decisions here tonight, we're just really receiving the report, but if there are any questions uh, from the committee to uh, Southern and Prosperity Partnership. Yeah, uh, go ahead, Councillor Green. Um, thank you very much, and through you, Mayor, and, and th thank you very much for the presentation. Just a quick question, briefly. Um, what are some of the implications of the pandemic and the recovery uh, and challenges ahead for SIPs? You touched on them, but I just wondered if you could give us a couple of examples. Thank you. Uh, Emily? Yeah, we're, we're, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, um, um, I think the question I didn't fully hear, but some of the, the issues coming out of the pandemic and, and how we, um, some of the economic challenges, is that, that basically it? Yes, that's correct. Okay, yeah. yeah so the, the biggest story for us that we're finding is that um, it's a sort of tale of two economies. And, and you see on the one side, um, you know, real estate's done surprisingly well. Um, and also uh, technology has been doing, you know, pretty well, um, uh, substantially better than other sectors. Um, and obviously stock prices are just unexplainably, <laughs> pretty much unexplainably high. Um, and yet it, that doesn't really uh, explain what's going on in a lot of other sectors. So we're seeing dramatically a different sort of forecast in retail services, uh, restaurants, tourism, Anything that's sort of service-led is being impacted. Um, it, it, it's not looking good, I'll be honest. We're, we're hoping to get more support from, from federal and provincial government to be able to provide still some liquidity in those areas. Um, but it, 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 uh, it could very well be, be quite devastating for a lot of businesses. Um, I'll, I'll stop there because I can't see your faces and, and you might be, <laughs> Dallas might um, add in something if I missed anything. No, that really helps. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rosenwald. Any, any other questions? Yeah, Councillor Braithwaite. Um, thank you. Um, just uh, wanted to also thank um, Ms. Rosenroll for the uh, for the presentation and to really again reiterate that um, the slide where it showed uh, what Oak Bay's percentage would be um, for the five years um, 
the, the next five years and how that will be less or, or at e equal pace as, as what it was for this last year that we paid. And I, I think it's good that the committee or that, that the um, staff of SIP really listened to the um, municipal partners and uh, took all of that information into account. And so I'd like to thank them for that. Uh, thank you, Councillor Braithwaite. Any other thank you. comments? Not seeing any. Um, I don't think, do we need a motion to receive this formally? No, we're good. Okay, so uh, information received. Thank you very much uh, for being here in person and thank you for being online, Ms. Rosenroll, and uh, enjoy your evening. Thank you very much for everything you are all doing. It's a, it's a very difficult time and we appreciate it. Thank you. Fine. So uh, up next on our agenda, we have a uh, uh, the uh, Jay Fenwick Lansdowne tribute, um, and we have a couple of guests, uh, I believe, coming in to to speak to us uh, to present. Um, we're going to have a slightly shorter presentation. I think it's just a verbal presentation. Um, this is uh, as a uh, as a piece in front of us. We've received a number of pieces of correspondence for our consideration. If anybody from the public wishes to comment, uh, you can call in to our main number and uh, you'll be queued up for at the moment of public participation. Um, that number, 250-598-3311. That's 250-598-3311. And uh, uh, we'll hold you there in queue. Again, this is specifically if you want to speak to the Jay Fenwick Lansdowne tribute. I'm giving this little uh, talk as we uh, wipe down and sanitize our, our speaker table. Uh, in a wonderfully coordinated effort of our staff. Thank you so much. We have, we're on item number two for the Jeff Ben McLean's zone. Welcome. We have Mr. Marshall and uh, I believe Mr. Siwa here with us this evening. Welcome. Uh, just to, to give an introduction, we have the written reports and the information. Um, but welcome here this evening, Mr. Marshall. Uh, you have to just push the button to turn it, the microphone on. There. Uh, maybe you can just s give your name formally for the group here and, uh, and just uh, give us a quick overview of what's in front of us. Good evening. My name is Rick Marshall. I'm a resident of Oak Bay. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address you this evening. Can you hear me all right? Mr. Marshall, just move the microphone a little closer to yeah. your mouth or lean forward a bit and uh, that will help. Is that better? It's a bit better, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Early in 2019, Jacques Sirois and Chris Garrett initiated a project to celebrate the life and art of the late Fennec Lansdowne, <coughs> a world-famous painter of birds who lived and worked most of his life in Oak Bay and whose art was inspired by the abundant bird life here in our naturehood. Their concept was an attractive and enduring outdoor display to celebrate the combined, combined elements of Oak Bay's cultural and natural heritage, to inform and educate viewers about Lansdowne's remarkable life and art, as well as the beautiful nature of our shores. At their invitation, the Community Association of Oak Bay readily supported this idea. The project was publicly launched in April 2019 when a packed house meeting of the association saw Robert Amos present an illustrated lecture on Lansdowne's life and art. Subsequently, we presented the concept of the Lansdowne tribute to the Oak Bay Heritage Foundation, the former Parks, Recreation and Culture Commission, and the Kiwanis Club of Oak Bay. All responded very positively. On behalf of the association, it has been an exciting honor for me to work with Chris and Jacques over the past months. We have now reached the final stage of design for the Fennec Lansdowne tribute, 
<coughs> and we are quite excited about how it's turned out. J. Fennick Lansdowne, the subject of all this, was born in Hong Kong in 1937, the only <laughs> child of British parents. When he was three years old, he moved with his family to Victoria. His interest in birds began around the age of five, and by 13, he was painting them. He was inspired by regular outings to view local birds in their natural settings, including along Oak Bay shores. Gifted with natural talent and self-taught, his partial paralysis from infantile polio did not deter him from becoming a brilliant and renowned artist. A passionate naturalist and birder, Lansdowne has been recognized as one of the world's foremost painters of birds. Living and working in Oak Bay most of his life, he painted many species of birds from this region, Canada, and distant lands. <coughs> He illustrated several books, include, including two volumes on the birds of the West Coast, which he also wrote. He was commissioned to paint the birds of Hong Kong and rare birds of China. His meticulous art is found in numerous collections worldwide and has been exhibited in prestigious institutions internationally. He was appointed a member of the Royal Canadian Academy of Arts, an officer of the Order of Canada, received an honorary degree from the University of Victoria and the Order of British Columbia. He died here on July 27th, 2008. We've been very gratified by the enthusiastic support this project has received from many in the community, some of whom have fond memories and stories of Fennec Lansdowne and his family. We are also delighted to say the installation is now fully funded. Jacques received a grant from Nature Canada to support his ongoing work to promote appreciation and protection of nature in the city through their Naturehood program. This enabled us to engage Chris Edley, a designer with much experience in preparing outdoor display signage for BC Parks and Parks Canada. In December, the Qantas Club of Oak Bay confirmed a grant of $5,000 to support this project followed in February by another 5,000 from the Victorian Natural History Society. This covers costs of design and fabrication and a suitable unveiling event. My esteemed colleague and friend, Jacques Sirois, will now share with you the backstory of his commitment to this tribute initiative, his ensuing connections with the Lansdowne family, and will describe the important stories told by the panels of the display design, which I guess you have. Jacques retired to Oak Bay a few years ago after a career of studying and teaching about wildlife and protecting nature. He has since worked tirelessly in our community to promote public appreciation of the wondrous nature that surrounds us here in the city. Jacques' work has been recognized by his being named a Fellow of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. Thank you very much for your attention and your consideration, and Jacques will take your questions. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Thank you. <coughs> Just give us a second here to swap over our... <laughs> Everything takes just a little bit longer. And again, if anybody wishes to call in on this item, the phone number 250-598-3311. Um, we'll have some questions and we'll make a recommendation, but we'll, uh, if there's anybody wishes to add additional comments, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, that number again, 250-598-3311. Thank you. Mr. Sirwa, welcome. Good evening. If I may, you just have to push the button to turn the microphone. If you could just say your name again for the record. And I just will point out, we have to get through things tonight, and I don't want to curtail this, but we'll get to questions and things after. But if you try to keep this one of the I will be very brief. So. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sirois. My name is Jacques Sirois, resident of Oak Bay. 
Uh, I just want to make a few additional off-the-cuff remarks. Uh, this project started in 2018, essentially. I met uh, the son of Finnick Lansdowne, Tristram, and he graciously sent me 26 illustrations from Birds of the West Coast, Volume 1 and Volume 2. So uh, the, I have met uh, Helen and Tristram Lansdowne numerous times over the last two or three years, and they are strong supporters of the project beyond my expectations. Uh, so out of the 26 images that were sent to me at Christmas 2018, we retained five bird species to illustrate this, uh, the, the, the signs. Uh, the black oyster catcher, the bufflehead, the Pacific great blue heron, three species that we see quite readily right at Queen's Park. And we chose also the marble merlet, which is always in our waters in Oak Bay, but we don't necessarily see. And uh, the Pacific Black Brant. Uh, the Brant uh, had a lot to do with the creation of the historic bird sanctuary that surrounds uh, Oak Bay in, in entirety. So we selected five bird species. We went through the draft that you have seen, I think is number six or seven. We've gone through seven drafts. Uh, this was taken very seriously. And, uh, and it was a lot of fun. I just want to mention to you that uh, Nature Canada supports this. The president of Nature Canada supports this. Nature Canada, formerly known as the Audubon Society of Canada. And Fenwick Lansdowne was a personal friend of the uh, former president of the Audubon Society of Canada, John Livingstone. So in some respect, we are, we are going back to the future somehow. It's nice to see the Nature Canada involved in this. And, uh, what else should I, I add? Uh, you'll notice the bird silhouettes on the signs. There's a kingfisher, there's oyster catchers. This is on purpose uh, to, we want this to be uh, family friendly and attractive to children and, and to adults, of course. So uh, what else should I say? I think I will keep it at this. Uh, it's been a, an honor for me to work on this honestly and to meet uh, the widow and the son of Frenick uh, Lansdowne on numerous occasions. And I uh, just want to s finish by saying that Queen's Park, where the, we hope to see the uh, tribute put, is where Finnick used to go early in the morning every day with his children to watch the ducks in the morning light. Exactly where we're going to put this. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sirwa, and I just uh, think as we start here, I express our appreciation on behalf of the community for all of the work undertaken um, by yourself, uh, Mr. Marshall, and many of the other people who have been involved uh, fundraising and uh, and uh, seeking partners in this and, and moving it from an idea into a into something really tangible in front of us today for, for consideration. So thank you for all that work. Uh, Councillor Patterson, you wish to have a question or a comment? I just would thank you, Mayor. I would just also like to comment. Um, I know that the all members of the Heritage Commission and the Heritage Foundation are, are really thrilled to see this project um, move forward in this way. Um, and I, on behalf of all of them, would like to thank Mr. Marshall and Mr. Sirwa for the extremely thoughtful, professional, um, and collaborative. Uh, work that they have done to bring this project together. We really appreciate in the community. Um, I am a, a huge Lansdowne fan. I was amazed to learn that Lansdowne actually lived in Oak Bay, and, and, and I knew where he painted, but I didn't realize he was a resident of Oak Bay. I learned that from these two gentlemen who um, are, as I, I can attest to, uh, always always knowledgeable, but always bring humor and fun to all of the projects. So thank you for your hard work. And I'm happy to see this go back to council for approval. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Patterson. I just would point out if there's any questions of Mr. Heidley as well, uh, he is available on the line uh, as well. Uh, Councillor Braithwaite. Um, thank you. I'd actually like to just go ahead and move the recommendation from staff because I think that um, I just would like to do that and then I'll give my comments. That sounds good. Is there Second. a second? Seconded. Thank you very much. And I, I don't want this to diminish the enormous amount of work. I hate not. We should be spending hours here celebrating this, but we'll have to do that at the, at the ceremony when it's approved. 
uh, and, and built because uh, we have a lot to get through tonight, unfortunately. Uh, Councillor Braithwaite. I'll just make it very quick. Um, I also would reiterate um, Councillor Patterson's um, comments and also um, recognize Chris Garrett as well, um, yes. whose house we were at when we first were discussing this, um, this project. And I think that it's wonderful how the community has come together and you found the funding for this and I'm just so pleased to be able to support it. So thank you both very much. Thank you, Councillor Councillor Green. Just very quickly through you, Mayor, I would like to thank both Mr. Sirwa and Mr. Marshall for the tremendous work and also a personal appreciation and thank you for having my husband and I down to the site to see where this is proposed because, m as they know, my husband uh, uh, attended school with, with Fennec and, and knew him briefly. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Green. Any other questions or comments at this time? Not seeing any, I will call the question on the motion. All those in favor? Opposed? None opposed. Thank you very much. Thank you both very much for coming here tonight. Uh, I look forward to having a lovely conversation in person uh, when this goes forward. And, on site. Uh, on site. On site, yes. Please put park. this up. So yes. thank you very much uh, for your time here tonight and for all the work that you've done to put this together. Thank so thank you. Thank you. Uh, our staff will escort you out through our safety lines and sanitize our station. Oh, all right. Uh, Ms. Hopkins, just for my clarification, there were no people waiting to speak to this item, were there? Okay, thank you. Yeah. As soon as we uh, sanitize the station, um, we will uh, we'll move on to the next agenda item. In fact, there's nobody, uh, oh yes. Uh, We'll have Ms. Bay, I believe, coming forward to, to do a quick uh, presentation and overview, and then we'll get to questions. The next item on the agenda is the Oak Bay Marina lease. We have in front of us tonight a draft RFP um, for our consideration. We're uh, here to give some feedback uh, and any direction that we as a body wish to make uh, to this, and uh, that will be a recommendation for council to approve um, uh, at an upcoming council meeting. Uh, if anybody wishes from the public to speak to this agenda item, again, the phone number is 250-598-3311, 598-3311. And uh, you can call in any time uh, as we're in this discussion. Uh, after we uh, have the presentation and ask questions, I will open it uh, if anybody on the line wishes to add any comments or suggestions or questions, uh, you may do so as well. Unless you are potential proponent, then I don't think we're going to take your <laughs> take those. Uh, we have with us this evening Ms. Bay, our Director of Strategic Initiatives, uh, who's been instrumental in putting this together. Um, welcome, Ms. Bay. And you can take off your mask at that table. I think it's a sanitary station at this point. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the purpose of the report that's before you today is to set in motion the selection of a leasehold operator of the municipally owned marina facilities. Uh, the current lease uh, is with the Oak Bay Marine Group and that expires at the end of 2022. So uh, entering into a new lease requires that we go through a competitive process to select a proponent to operate the marina for the next 30 year period, which uh, goes from 2023 to 2052. The staff report uh, provides a draft RFP for public review and comment and for council's consideration. So that's really why it's coming to today's meeting as a committee of the whole meeting. Uh, this would then come for uh, ratification at next week's council meeting, uh, incorporating whatever input is provided by council tonight. Uh, the RFP calls for submissions aligned with Oak Bay's OCP, so the content that you see in the RFP is not dreamt out of nothing. It, it was uh, referencing uh, Oak Bay's OCP as a, as a statement of community values. Uh, so that is referenced, and, and it's also referenced that what the RFP is about is creating a vital and happening place at the site for both the current generation uh, and uh, leaving a positive legacy for future generations. Uh, once proposals are submitted, staff will assess eligible proposals against uh, RFP technical requirements which have been set out in the document. Uh, proposals that meet a minimum threshold of 70% would then advance to the next stage which would be the uh, uh, public review and council scoring of the community amenity value. And uh, proposals that score at least 70% on both the technical component and the community amenity components would then have the financial components assessed. 
So each of those components, so there's essentially three components to it, the technical piece, the community amenity piece, and the financial piece, and each of those would be awarded 50 points. The total score would determine the proponent with whom the district would commence lease negotiations. So that's kind of how the scoring is set out. Um, with respect to an RFP of this type, it's obviously a long-term lease and it, it involves a, a lot of money for both the proponent and, and potentially for the, uh, for the district as well. And so it's really important that fairness and transparency be governing principles in, in a process like that. Uh, and to make sure that that uh, fairness to one person isn't necessarily fairness to another person. So uh, what we've done is uh, engage the services of an independent fairness advisor to really watch over this process and make sure that whatever we're doing is consistent with principles of fairness and transparency. Uh, so that independent fairness advisor is Mr. Keith Hennessy. Uh, I have given, he's been part of developing what, what you have before you and he has confirmed the procedural appropriateness of the proposed RFP process including the scoring approach. Uh, in fact, he's on the line right now to answer any questions that, uh, that council may have with respect to, uh, to fairness uh, and to advise on, on any implications uh, on fairness of any RFP changes potentially contemplated by council. So uh, just to kind of getting to the end of my notes here, uh, to ensure uh, fairness to all potential, that's a tongue twister, potential proponents, <laughs> uh, the RFP stipulates that proponents and their agents uh, must not contact any member of council with respect to this RFP. Uh, and that's really to make sure that, uh, that all proponents are, are treated equally. Uh, so we've stated quite uh, clearly that all proponent contact with the district must be through the Director of Strategic Initiatives, which is, which is me. Uh, the timeline to conclude lease negotiations such that a new lease can be in place is, is very tight. Uh, so staff do need council direction uh, on issuance of an RFP fairly promptly. Uh, to maximize our opportunities for successful negotiations. And when you see the timeline that's set out in the report, it may seem like a long time from now, two years and a bit from, from now, uh, but we're really wanting to, to provide a, a fair bit of time to the actual negotiation stage uh, because one never knows what happens uh, during those stages, how complex it is, uh, whether we're successful in, in uh, uh, getting a negotiated lease with the, the proponent that we enter into uh, discussions with. So we're wanting to to provide plenty of time there to give council flexibility. So really the decision before you today is whether you're comfortable with authorizing staff to post the RFP as is or whether you would like any changes and if so what those are uh, and uh, whatever changes you direct uh, we'll incorporate into the document so that when it comes before you for uh, approval uh, at the next uh, at the council meeting next week uh, you will see uh, the document that uh, that you're after. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Bay. And uh, I just want to point out to everybody here, there, there have been changes g being made since it was first posted, and there's nothing substantial materially, but there are some changes into that. So just make sure you're looking at the, uh, you've refreshed, you're looking at the updated version of that RFP. Um, and uh, yes, welcome, Mr. Hennessy, on the phone. Um, I turn this over to uh, the committee. If there's, uh, are there questions? Uh, ideas, thoughts on, on the aspects of this RFP. Uh, we'd like to give as clear a direction as possible because uh, staff will, uh, if we can, will accommodate any changes uh, and make it move it forward into the uh, next council meeting if possible to heat our timelines. Uh, Councillor Zelka, you had your hand up. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Much appreciated. And thank you so much uh, uh, to our Director of um, Strategic, uh, Strategic uh, Services, uh, a fabulous um, uh, work done, uh, very, very impressive. Uh, uh, this appears to be much more than nine months worth of work. I, I, I was uh, 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 very impressed at the, uh, at the, at the quality and the, the um, completeness. So thank you so much for that. Uh, I wanted to ask you just a couple of questions. Yeah, I don't know, it's, it's, the, it's the sort of, uh, um, uh, since I've responded to proponents in the past, I, I, I have an eye that is like, oh my God, is, is this an inconsistency or what do I do with this? Um, it says that no one can, uh, uh, no one, no proponent can uh, uh, contact anyone other than through you. Um, but what about the fairness advisor? Could they contact the fairness advisor separately from you or would that always have to be through you? 
Ms. Bay? Uh, thank, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the, uh, I guess it really depends on the nature of what they're complaining about. If they're complaining about a uh, fairness issue from me, uh, then I would suggest that it would be fair to go directly to the fairness advisor, but on any other matters, I would expect the communications to come through, through me just for, um, for consistency. And th that makes sense. Uh, I just wasn't quite sure with the, with the existing wording, and, and I'll leave that to, to you to... to to, to, to manage. Um, now, since we all go on vacation, and, and uh, this is quite a long timeline, um, is there a, 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 an idea for an acting uh, director of uh, strategic services for when you're not available for, like, like who would they contact when you're not around? That Thank you, Councillor Zelka. <laughs> Thank you, through, the uh, through, your, through your worship. Uh, in that case, we would appoint uh, an acting uh, director to, to, to take that kind of uh, a call, although I don't really have a team, so <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have, to, I'll have to get that sorted with our, with our CAO. Um, but I certainly don't anticipate being gone during the critical stages of, of this process. So uh, this is the biggest project I have on, on my agenda, so uh, I am uh, I'm, I'm planning to, to, to see, it, uh, see it through. And, uh, and to make sure that I'm here at the critical stages. And, and really those RFP uh, contacts, uh, say that we're really talking about the stage between now and mm -hmm. when the RFP is due at the yeah. end of November. So uh, I, I don't have any vacation plans during that time. <laughs> Um, and if I may, uh, um, uh, one or two more quick questions. Um, I was very, very pleased to see the district is interested in proposals for how to manage the boats moored in the nearby bay, how that could be addressed, especially in the, the picture on page 13 of the uh, RFP, uh, almost highlights the issue uh, outside of the area with all those boats that are in, I guess we would have to call that the eelgrass area. I'm not quite sure what to call that bay. Um, uh, so I'm very pleased to see that that's included and I look forward to seeing what, what ideas come forward on that. Uh, and, and related is a thank you so much for including not only the eelgrass thing, uh, but also the wonderful brainstorming work done uh, on, um, on the uh, uh, placemaking work. Uh, absolutely fabulous to see that in there uh, and, uh, and seeing what will what'll, what'll come of it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Zelka. I have Councillor Green. Thank you, Mayor, and through you to Ms. Bay. Thank you, Ms. Bay, for an incredibly comprehensive RFP um, proposal, or not a proposal, I guess it's the RFP document. We'll have a proposal in the future, but I really appreciate all of the work that went into this. As well, I agree with Councillor Zelka. Um, it, it was great to see some of the innovative ideas that, that people were talking about, and um, I'm, I'm sufficiently satisfied. I have no other questions, and I just really appreciate the time and effort you've You've committed to this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Green. Councillor Appleton. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and, and through you to staff. Uh, I had a, a question uh, just regarding uh, sort of picking up in that same section of the of the RFP on page thirteen, the information available to uh, proponents, and I'm just wondering whether or not we could look at potentially providing a little bit more uh, precision and specificity about the actual uh, area that's covered by the lease. Uh, because there's a map included in the RFP that, that shows the general area of Turkey Head overall. Uh, but as we know, not all of the lots, that, that, that area is broken down into multiple legal lots and not all of them are subject to the lease. And, and I know this is obviously gonna be, be made clear to the proponent in any case. Um, but I'm just wondering, it, it, in further information for the proponent, it refers to the existing lease bylaw, which in and of itself also includes a, a, a sketch plan and, and mapping, but that mapping isn't very precise either, and, and I know that there's mixed up jurisdictions. So I, I'm, I'm aware that obviously this information is going to be made available to uh, proponents in any case, but whether or not there's a possibility of laying out actu an actual legal map as part of the RFP to show, show those legal lots which are covered uh, by the RFP document. That might be a step too far, but that was just something that stood out to me. I'll just I'll turn that into a bit of a question, which is like, how is that information shared with any proponents interested, uh, and should that be included within the RFP document itself? Um, the, one of the background documents that's referenced in this RFP is, um, I'm just looking through here. Da, 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 da. 
Um, yeah, so, so as was mentioned, the, um, the, the, the previous lease document does include um, some of that information, but it is something that I could probably work with our mapping um, staff to provide a more detailed map. I, I do have more detailed information, um, not in a, a fantastic map, but probably something that we could put together in, in a more legible map um, um, to provide uh, a little bit more clarity. But the, the plan here is to include basically the same areas was captured in the, the, the 1993 lease. Um, but having said that, those, uh, those documents are, are not the greatest photocopies of the scans that are available online. So I can certainly appreciate that people might be after a little bit more. Okay, thank you. Councillor Appleton? Just a quick follow-up, Your Worship. Thank you through you to staff. Um, and, and thank you for that because I appreciate that. It seems to be that there's a, a lack of, of one good high quality map that shows the different lots and, and sort of it does appear to be sort of photocopies of photocopies and those kinds of things. So at some point, even if it's for our own purposes, it might be good to have a really good quality map, but with recognizing limitations on technology and those kinds of things. And, and just as a quick follow up, I, I, I make that point not just for clarity for the proponent, but also because as, as staff has captured in the report and in the RFP, there is an interest in potentially uh, decreasing or rethinking the idea of, of some of the parking spots, that you know, the reevaluation of parking writ large as a concept uh, is in the RFP, and that's great. Uh, but I guess that would also pertain to if a proponent is viewing the site overall, as we know there's some leased, uh, some parking area which is covered by the lease, and some parking area which is not covered by the lease. And so I think it would be useful for the proponent to be aware that the area of parking outside of the lease is under the jurisdiction of the district and that area may itself also be considered for other uses beyond parking. And so the, the availability of that sum total of parking outside of the lease area uh, should be taken into consideration by the by the proponent that that's not necessarily going to be there available indefinitely as free parking over the so, uh, over the total time of the lease. So, and I, and I, I think that comes across through the various mentions of parking as a concept in the RFP. But I think it might be useful to just clarify that there's that there's that district owned parking area outside of the lease area that is uh, clearly under the jurisdiction and future decision making of the district. Uh, thank you, Councillor Appleton. Uh, I have Councillor uh, Patterson, then Councillor Braithwaite. Thank you, and, and like everyone else, I, I thank Ms. Bay for um, uh, the very comprehensive um, uh, document that she has put together here. Just on the, on the technical review, um, when the uh, when the review is 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 actually available and it is being scored, um, do you foresee uh, enlisting services of any other uh, technical representatives other than the fairness, fairness advisor that we have mm -hmm. in order to, um, to gauge the, um, the merits of the, um, the technical review that comes in? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilor Patterson. Ms. Bay? Uh, thank you, uh, through your worship. Um, We've phrased the documents such that we have provided for that possibility without committing to it in advance because we're not sure what type of technical experts might be needed, but we certainly anticipate that uh, we may need some additional technical expertise that we don't have in-house, but exactly what that looks like, we don't know until we see the proposals. And, and so it could be everything from building professionals to, to leasing professionals to environmental professionals. It, it, we really don't know at this point, um, but we've provided for that from a process perspective so that uh, we're solid uh, from, uh, from a fairness perspective. Go ahead, Councilor Patterson. Thank you. If I could just also um, uh, just... I am. I have wondered. We did have re uh, reports done, technical reports on the uh, the existing facilities, um, and have uh, the consultants who provided the basis of those reports, who did the inspections and completed the reports for us. Um, they're fully knowledgeable about this process that it's underway because I have no doubt that um, that they will be contacted probably by the proponents in order to um, obtain information. So. I don't know what their status is like during this pandemic time, but uh, I can see that it might be a little difficult in in connecting all of the all of the players. So I'm hoping that they 
being forewarned or are prepared for questions coming their way to help expedite the process. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Um, I have uh, nothing else. Councillor Braithwaite and then Councillor Green. Thanks so much, and through you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to reiterate um, the comments of my fellow councillors on the quality of the document. I think um, we should be very proud of this coming forward. Um, I do have a question, and I, I'm going to apologize because I had put it in the form of an email question to both you and Ms. Varela last night, and unfortunately, I had forgotten to send press send, so I didn't get to do that till later on today when I realized it was sitting on my desktop. But it was around um, uh, point number 2.1, electronic submission on uh, page 7 in the document. And I know that we have had some issues in the past um, receiving documents from outside people um, coming into the municipality. And so my question was, or my suggestion was that um, it might be... Um, uh, that we would ask the proponents to put a list of whatever documents are, are, are supposed to be attached um, inside their email. Just, just as a reminder, because I would hate for someone to send in an RFP and be missing two documents and for us to not accept their, their, um, uh, their, applic their, their, their proposal um, because of that. And I know it does say that you, you, we should request an email from purchasing to verify that their proposal has been received, but I'm thinking that if we had a list of the documents that they've sent to us that they're asking for uh, for a receipt of, that might be a, a little bit helpful. Thank you. Uh, and I have Councillor Green. Is that it, Councillor? Okay, thank you. I'm prepared to move the staff recommendation if that's appropriate. Um, before you do that, I'm just going to, uh, I have a couple of quick questions, and uh, I would, and Senator Zelka has a follow-up question. I'm also just going to uh, ask staff, are there anybody on the phones that's called into the meeting on this item? Your Worship, there is none. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Hopkins. Our, our technology is certainly entertaining, if not anything else. Um, but it gives the fairest access to everybody, so that's important. Um, I, just, I had a quick question for him, just for my own clarification. The community amenity portion of it, scoring 70%, is that, uh, is that coming to council to do that determination of whether it meets the criteria? Uh, where is that, that portion sort of judged at? Thank you, Your Worship. So the intent is that uh, the first stage will be the technical evaluation, which will be done uh, uh, by a group at minimum of staff, possibly some technical experts. And, and uh, so that part of it hasn't really been firmly determined yet. But uh, the, the proposals then that score at least 70% on that technical evaluation, which will include everything uh, uh, like the, the, the reference check, the, uh, the financial capability, and, and, uh, and the, uh, the, the company history and, and the, the other technical requirements that are spelled out in the document, if they score over 70% on that, then we'll come back to council uh, and uh, council will have an opportunity to then hear from the public before council scores that piece. So uh, the community amenity piece will be solely scored by council uh, and would be scored after hearing from the public. So I'm envisioning we'd have a committee of the whole meeting, uh, we, the, uh, the information uh, that we're asking the proponents to supply uh, would then be shared with council and the public and that would be the com community amenity piece of it and I think really importantly here how we've designed the process is that piece um, will not reveal who the proponents are so that, that's really to ensure as much fairness and impartiality as possible uh, and we're also asking the proponents not to disclose any proprietary information as part of that uh, piece um, so that it can be comfortably shared with the public and council and then I will come back to council for direction on, on how you want to proceed with that community amenity scoring piece. Uh, what we've set out at this point is uh, it's, it's your decision and that there would be provision for public input and that's as far as we've gone with it right now. But really ultimately it's up to council how you want to, to do that within the provisos that are spelled out in the, OC, uh, in the, uh, in the document. So you'll, you'll see what the criteria are, the, the kinds of questions that we're asking um, proponents to, um, 
to, to consider. That will be, we can't change that after the fact. Once the RFP goes out, uh, that is the information that you'll be scoring. So if you don't feel like that list of, of information that we're requesting for proponents uh, will give you the ability to fairly score or fully score that community amenity piece, now is the time to let us know that and we'll change it uh, so that you get what you need. Okay, thank you. I, I, my, my only, maybe you can just address the, the process of that because I can certainly see where uh, there, someone might say, well, we're just going to give you a bunch of cash and you guys decide what you want to do with the community amenity side of that. So how would we adjust, like how would we sort of say, well, that makes sense uh, in the consideration of what you're doing um, if the community amenity is essentially zero in that proponent, can we still get to the financial portion to, to assess that, that, that aspect of it? Uh, that's just at the back of my mind, I wouldn't want to set aside somebody who had a good proposal, but sort of said, we don't know, we'll leave it to you, but we'll give you money to do it sort of thing. So how, is that, how would that look like from our, our evaluation process? Yeah, so when you're scoring the community amenity piece, you won't have the financial piece yet. Um, but as long as uh, a proponent clears the 70% hurdle, their financial proposal will be open. So uh, that's a piece where it's important to look at the community amenity piece so that when the, and, and score it really on the basis of the community amenity piece, and then the financial proposal is worth as much points as the community amenity piece and will kind of the two will be played together uh, so something could score very highly on the community amenity piece but may not score so well on the financial proposal and then you will have those both pieces of information before making um, the, the the final decision and and really it's the what we're saying through this RFP is the is the proponent that scores the highest with the combined value of the technical and the community amenity and the financial proposal is the one that will uh, prevail in terms of being the the one selected uh, to be the one to be negotiated with okay uh, so, so that would lead to my question then on this is does it, the way I read the RFPs essentially as it is right now we wouldn't get be able to open the or the financial document unless we felt the community amenity was had hit a certain yeah. threshold uh, and I think my personal preference would be to do have them both seen uh, one publicly in terms of the uh, the community amenity and the other uh, privately um, because I think it is that balance of those two pieces so I don't I think that's just an order thing, but I don't know if that's if uh, that's my thought on that. Um, just because I, I would be afraid that that there might be some people who might not. Especially, it would be different to my mind if we had clearly articulated what we want from community amenities as a council. Uh, we have not had that opportunity, and so anybody looking at this, I, I'm I'm excited to give people the opportunity because there might be some fantastic ideas out there, the ways to enhance it. Um, but at the same time, there might not be. They might have great ideas of how to maximize revenue but 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 offer that other portion to us as a as a we'll make the space available but you decide what to do with it sort of piece so uh, that my preference from a, a process perspective um, and is there any uh, last question I have is just in the interest of just streamlining our our time spent on this is there any way of or any need to uh, limit the number or, or of applicants by financial capabilities or like establishing a bond or anything of that nature to, to make the application? Uh, or is that not necessary in this kind of uh, uh, application pro or RFP process? Um, ask, asking for a bond typically requires that we have, we, we're typically require that we have fairly set um, specifications um, and we don't in this case we're really looking for for people to or for proponents to put forward uh, interesting ideas and, and for council to be in a position to to uh, have those reviewed with the public and make a decision as to which uh, you deem to be most appropriate so it would be very difficult to ask for a bond in in the absence of having those performance criteria spelled out now that doesn't mean that a bond couldn't be asked for as part of the negotiation process which is the next stage where um, um, specifications could be spelled out a whole lot more clearly. Uh, keeping in mind, of course, the proponent has some skin in the game as well uh, in terms of any potential uh, improvements that would happen on the site uh, would be an investment on their part that uh, would serve as uh, potentially significant motivation to, uh, to not offer things up uh, that are, are going to fail. So I, th I think there's going to be motivation on top of the, on the, on the part of the proponents to put forward um, a, a solid proposal 
proposal. Uh, the financial capability of the firms is very much part of the first technical review. So uh, if we're getting the sense that this is a fly-by-night type of operation, um, they won't make the 70% cut to even come forward for, for consideration of the community amenity uh, portion. So um, there, there is a vetting process that will be in place, uh, including checking of references, uh, uh, establishing um, um, financial capacity to deliver on, on whatever is being promised. Okay, thank you. That, that yeah. satisfies me. I just was curious. What if more of the interest not in the later stages, but how do we keep the number of applicants down? Because there's a lot of work to go through these, even if they're not viable to start with. So, uh, But that, that makes sense to me as well from our process. So thank you for, for thinking through that. Um, I had, uh, Councillor Zelka as well had a question. Uh, thank you so much, oh. Chair, for the uh, opportunity to ask one more question. Uh, from the lens of the Oak Bay Emergency Program, um, uh, I was very pleased to see emergency management mentioned on page 12. Um, but I do also note that the Royal Canadian Marine Search and Rescue Station 33 um, uh, also known as the Oak Bay Navy, which I presume means our, our mayor is its uh, honorary commodore, uh, is stationed um, at the Oak Bay Marina, but it's not mentioned anywhere in this lease. Uh, is, uh, are you imagining uh, that it might be a community amenity that would maybe continue that location there, or are you imagining that, that they would, uh, they, the, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the SAR Station 33, would do their own negotiations with whoever the new proponent is, or, or are we just sort of leaving that unsaid at this moment? The, through, through your worship, I think if that's something that's important to council, that's something that could be stated outright um, as, as something that's, uh, that's desired. Uh, in the absence of that, it would be something that would be put forward as one of the services that are being proposed uh, as part of the package. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Braithwaite? Um, I, I think, um, I, I'm, it's, I'm, it's interesting that you brought that up because I was thinking about that when I was going through this document, but what I felt was that um, there is somewhere in here, and I can't put my finger on it right now, where it talks about um, non-profit organizations, and that's where I thought that, that uh, SARS would have, or the Oak Bay Sea Rescue would have fallen under, and that would be up to, I, I would imagine, each proponent to make a determination as to what, um, how they were going to include non-profit organizations within their proposal. Thank you, Ms. Bay. Uh, yes, uh, through you, Your Worship, uh, on, on page 17, uh, as, as part of the, um, um, proposal, what we're saying is indicate any proposed partnerships with other public, private, or nonprofit entities. Uh, and so that's, that's some of what we're asking for. We haven't net mentioned anybody by name in, in these cases, but uh, that's what I was alluding to when I was saying uh, we're, we're, we're interested in, in the proponents' proposals uh, for, those, uh, for those types of things. And, and you'll see that that list is fairly generic, and that's really intended to not um, limit people's imaginations too much so that hopefully you have uh, uh, a fair bit of vari variety to, um, to select from when, when it comes forward and some interesting ideas that we may not have thought about. And this is where we're, we're trying to avoid being too, too prescriptive uh, at the front end. Councillor Zucker. Uh, thank you. Final follow-up is um, uh, uh, th it appears to be a period of negotiation will uh, ensue after the proponent is selected. If for some reason this gets forgotten as, part as, a, as, a, as, a, as an item, could we be brought forward at that time? I'm just wondering whether we would still have that available to us. Mm -hmm. Ms. Bay? Yes, uh, through you, Your Worship, uh, you will have the opportunity to, uh, to assess the community amenity uh, package and determine whether uh, how you rate that and uh, through that uh, can leave us with directions as to what you uh, uh, would like us to negotiate should any of those particular proponents uh, be successful. Um, when you're looking at the community amenity piece, that's the second to last piece. So I will have to come back to you after we open the financial envelopes and say, this is the result of, of, uh, of what came out of the, the, the analysis, uh, uh, and this is the, the, the lead proponent, and, and what are your directions from here? So really, at, at all stages of this, you, you are in the driver's seat. Uh, I will note that this uh, proposal clearly says that council can, can accept uh, uh, one a, a proposal, or you could choose not to proceed at all if you decide that none of the proposals are what you're looking for. Um, you uh, very much remain in the driver's seat. All right. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor. I have uh, 
I have one question, uh, one other question about the document itself. In the document, it talks about um, collaboration with First Nations, and I am wondering if there is any um, dialogue from the municipality with First Nations prior to undertaking uh, this process. Ms. Bay? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so what we said is if any changes are proposed to the, the document, we're really strongly encouraged to the current uses that we're really strongly encouraging the proponents to have uh, discussion with the First Nations and asking them to identify the nature of the discussions that they've had and any feedback that they've received through that. Um, the challenge for us going and having discussions now in advance really is that we don't know what the proposed uses are going to be. So uh, it would be very hypothetical uh, in terms of of um, any discussions and we're really not the ones uh uh, who, are, who, are, who are making the drawings, so to speak, at this point. We're the ones that, uh, as the district, that are reviewing them. So um, at this point, we've left it with the proponents to have that discussion and identify, and then it, whatever comes back, if it's not deemed to be sufficient, the district can always take it to those next levels. Um, it's al also possible that the province may uh, have some requirements surrounding that. We're still waiting to hear back on, on, on that. So um, I think it's, it's still very... It, it's somewhat fluid at this point, but it's definitely uh, on our radar as, as uh, an important step in this process. Uh, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor, uh, and thank you, Ms. Bay, for that information. Uh, I, I guess my thought is that um, all communities uh, are operating now um, in this uh, emergency pandemic situation. I know certainly from work with other groups that I am am on that uh, some of the First Nations communities have been, um, ha you know, have been really struggling with the efforts be with their limited resources looking after that. That's, and so my, that was my reason for wondering if we, um, if there would be any um, benefit to perhaps having a brief introduction um, from either the council table or district staff just as a, um, an introduction that the pro that we were going forward with this project and that they may be contacted so that they might have an opportunity in advance to give thoughts as to how what that would look like to them and how they would manage that process. Sure, I'm happy to work with staff to make sure that's that's undertaken. Uh, that, that if this goes as this process goes forward, that they're aware of that. Uh, Councilor Green, you had your hand up. You're done? Okay. Sorry. I, I, out of the corner of my eye. Um, but it's easier here than on Zoom. Uh, Councillor Braithwaite, you wanted to make the motion? Uh, sure. Um, I'll uh, make, uh, I'll move the staff recommendation, uh, both the rec recommendation and the and further that. Both halves of that. I'll second. Moved and seconded. Uh, is there any further discussion on that? And I'm going to just, uh, it's moved, but we're a ways away from just uh, making the call. Is there any other, just want to ask staff one more time, uh, anybody at home if wishes to call in is welcome to do so. It's the last chance, though, 250-598-3311. I don't think uh, staff, any calls are in line. Okay, in queue. Uh, Councillor Zelka. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I, I trust that uh, any uh, pr prospective proponent will no doubt uh, check out this webcast uh, for uh, some insight into the types of things we're looking for and, uh, and the comments that I just made with respect to the uh, um, search and rescue will hopefully be picked up at that time. Uh, so I, I don't feel a need to, to modify this document, um, even though it is a bit vague, but I think, I think the idea is going to get through. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Just for my clarification of process, uh, I, if if one of the if proponents came with a question and asked, you know, who's the current, who, what partners are currently involved, which would be part, you know, Bay Rack and and Sea Rescue, et cetera, um, I'm assuming we would provide that information to all of the applicants equally. Is that how that uh, process would actually work? Yes, uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, if proponents have questions, what happens is they approach me as the project manager on this, and then uh, uh, in cases where it's uh, material information uh, and it's not uh, part of the RFP right now, I would issue an addendum and thereby uh, make sure that the information is, is provided to all potential uh, proponents so Very that good. the thank information you. is shared equally. Thank you, Ms. Bay. 
Uh, uh, Councillor Brith. Um, thank you. Um, and through you, Chair, I just want to again say um, thank you so much for the quality document. I think that um, the quality of this document um, is reflected in the lack of changes that we're now giving you um, <laughs> or asking for. Um, and I think that you have done a, a, a fabulous job, and I'm very, very proud. And I can't wait to see what submissions we have coming in. So thank you for that. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to raise if anybody wishes to take my my earlier point. If, they, if anybody, if the, if the body wishes to look at the uh, financials and the community amenities simultaneously, uh, that would require a motion to a uh, amendment motion to this motion, just to say that would be a change. If that's not the will of the body, then I will follow the process that's laid out here to look at the community amenities first, and then based on that 70%, move to the f to the financials, which is the the way that's proposed. So, I'll leave it. Not seeing any. Oh, Councilor Brith. Can, can you just kind of walk through that again, just so that we have a, a good um, understanding of exactly what you're suggesting? Sure, and, and I'm, I'll, I'm going to turn to Ms. Bay to make sure that I'm not misstating what I, my understanding of the process. Uh, my understanding is right now, as laid out here, um, the staff will do the detailed analysis. Is it is it a viable application from a technical perspective? Um, then there's two other pieces. One, they have to provide a community amenity, which is stripped of all identifying factors, but outlines what amenities would be provided to the broader community within this proposal. Uh, we would judge that uh, for those that meet, say we think, yes, those are reasonable community amenities, meeting a 70% threshold as we, as we judge it, uh, then we would open the financial component of that proposal of those ones that meet the 70% threshold. Um, I'm just saying my comfort level would be that we, we open them all, one publicly, one privately, um, uh, just be in case that the financial overrides the, the I mean, if there's a weak of one and a strong of the other that we see both. Um, is that a fair uh, assessment or am I misstating that process? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I, I think you're correct in terms of, of how the process is designed uh, to work right now. Uh, the reason the financial piece has been separated from the community amenity piece really does relate to fairness and, and setting things out so that the um, community amenity score is scored purely on the basis of the community amenity uh, piece so that, in fact, it isn't colored by the um, financial piece because the um, otherwise you may as well kind of combine the score and, and the challenge of course is the financial piece is going to very quickly it, it might be difficult to separate out and, and anonymize that piece uh, and um, thereby um, it may also be more challenging to uh, maintain the confidentiality of the proposal if the community amenity piece is going to be reviewed in public and the financial piece is kind of open at the same time, but potentially behind closed doors. If council has that information, it may be very challenging to start to separate that out in uh, a, a public forum where the, the where the public is providing that input. So um, is it doable? We could probably find a way to do it if, the, if that's council's wish. It does fundamentally start to change how the RFP has been structured and it would probably trigger a number of other changes. I, I'd, I'd wanna go back and, and review that with our uh, um, with our advisors to make sure that, uh, in fact, that could be made to work. Or uh, alternatively, I, I, I suspect uh, Mr. Hennessy is on the line, <laughs> so you, you, you can hear directly from him if you'd like to hear him uh, weigh in. Okay, I, okay so it, it, it's from my understanding of this process. Uh, if we get the community amenity, if one of those had, uh, we saw that it met like a 60% of what we were sort of hoping for and that we would not open the financial packages at that point. That's correct, Your Worship. So uh, something would have to score 70%. Now, having said that, Council is uh, is in control of what scores 70%. So if you're wanting it to get to the point, <laughs> uh, you can differentiate in that regard. You can give uh, a way better community uh, amenity proposal 100 po points and, and score that one that you're wondering about 71 points. So it, that, that part is really up to you in terms of, of uh, you, you would have that scope to um, a assign those uh, points in the way that you think is fair. Um, and um, 
we can certainly, we could ask um, proponents even for additional information if you have questions at that point uh, about the community amenities. That's part of what we've set out for in the RFP. If you're in doubt about uh, uh, some of those components, that's something that we can, uh, we can seek more information directly from the, from the applicants and uh, uh, we would anonymize it obviously before coming back to you so that you could maintain that fairness uh, perspective. Fair, and I don't want to disrupt that process. I don't think that's that's. I think what you've thought through this process fairly fairly carefully. Um, my last question on this, then, to you, Ms. Bay, would just be: uh, Would there be advantageous, just given how little we know about the financial attached to that, to drop that threshold down to say if they have to be a fifty percent threshold? That would mean a very low community amenity. We still get through. We'd look at it, but it would have a hard time making up that gap uh, from the financial standpoint. Uh, is that is that a reasonable? Or do they have to be set essentially equal across the board? Your worship, it does not have to be equal. You could set that seventy percent at fifty percent, or forty percent, or whatever you choose to set it at. Okay, I guess my concern of leaving it at seventy with them would be just sorry. I'm 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 arguing my case here, but just um, I'm thinking through this. Uh, you know, if we wanted to give that gap, um, we wanted to see the second, but we had to give seventy percent. It would give an a, an unnaturally high rating to maybe a weak community amenity piece that might not. So I just that's my thinking on that, but. Uh, we have a motion on the floor right now, so if there's nobody else sharing my concerns, we'll just move it forward as it is. I just, that's my piece. Councillor Green. Yes, thank you. And I, I do have a question. I'm, I'm going to circle back to the First Nations piece and through you, Mayor, to Ms. Bay. Just for clarity, um, you said that you would in encourage pro proponents to approach First Nations. Is there any way that we can be more explicit about that expectation? Can it be part of uh, the, the process, um, a, a requirement of the process? Uh, and that's just a question. Thank you. Uh, through through your worship, um, um, there's nothing stopping you from requiring it. Uh, if it's set as a requirement, though, then it must be done, and you cannot consider a proposal that has not done it. So um, a, a should indicates that it's an expectation and, and, and that we're looking for it. A, a must uh, disqualifies the, uh, uh, them if they haven't done it. So it, it's just an RFP language is, is very specific when it comes to the, the, the should versus the musts. And, and so it really depends on, on where council is at with respect to that, what word you wish to choose. But I, I just put that forward. So, so that <laughs> it's, it's clear what the implications are. Thank you, Ms. Bay. Thank you. Um, through you, just a supplemental. Ms. Bay, in your experience, have, have other communities uh, required First Nations consultation on something similar like, like this? Um, you know, it's, I, I know this is somewhat unique to obey, but in your experience, have there been other, other communities that have, have uh, had that as a requirement? as a, a must instead of a should. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I haven't been part of an, a marina RFP process. They're, 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 they're fairly rare. Uh, I've been part of other types of RFPs, but uh, this is my first, so, so I'm afraid I'm not able to comment on that in the context of a, a marina RFP. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any other discussion here before uh, Councillor Zelka? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I do uh, take um, a note of your, your concerns and uh, um, observations about the uh, need to get to the, uh, through um, to the qualification aspect. And um, I, I, I imagine, while I'm very interested in the community and uh, many value prop uh, proposals, that uh, dropping the score to uh, 25 points or 50 percent to be considered qualified and to get to the next step is something that I, I, I could support. And uh, uh, if we could figure out a way to come up with a motion that would tie in with this, uh, I would certainly um, like to put that forward. The motion would just be, we have a motion on the floor to, to move it forward. The motion would just be to amend the wording to, to set that to, uh, to a 50% threshold on the, on the community amenity before the financial piece is opened. I would like to move that. As, uh, and I will see, is there a seconder? Councillor Braithwaite seconds. I think we've already talked about it, but Councillor Zalka, anything you want to add? No, I, 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 as I said, I, I agree with, uh, with, your, with your concern. Uh, um, on one hand, I, I don't want to see the, the financial aspects until the uh, evaluation of community amenities is done, but at the same time, I also don't want to um, uh, uh, cut out uh, uh, viable propositions uh, um, or proposals that, uh, that may actually have um, um, some elements that are, that are further on that, that could potentially be used for other purposes. So um, that's, that's all. Councillor Patterson? 
Thank you, Mayor. I'm finding this discussion quite quite interesting, <laughs> uh, particularly since we don't really have a, uh, a wish list of community amenities. It's uh, you know it, it, it's debating in a void, so to speak. But um, it could could I perhaps have clarification on what is deemed to be a community amenity if the use if some of the use or operation that produces some of the financial results, is that use also considered as an amenity or is it just considered in the financial piece? Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, Ms. Bay, is there a clearly defined community amenity uh, portion of this? Uh, the, 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 I, I guess <laughs> the reason the community amenity has been, one of the reasons it's been left to council is really that's, that's a, a governance type of decision, what you consider an amenity, and it's not something that uh, is really for, for staff to determine, so that's why we've left it uh, vague, and uh, you may consider uh, a, a revenue-producing restaurant a, a community amenity, or you may not, and uh, we don't really know at this point what, um, what the public has to say about that either so um, that's why it's been left um, undetermined at this point thank you miss bay i don't see any other discussion on this i'll just two two seconds on it i i, I am my my big concern here would just be a a, an off, a situation where one proponent had a million dollars in revenue to the community but weak community amenities uh portion of it and the other one had a um uh, you know, very strong community amenity, but we have very little revenue. And over the course of 30 years, that might make an enormous difference uh, of that portion. So I, I would support that that threshold be dropped. It doesn't change the, the ranking or the level of importance attached to the community amenity. That's, that remains the same. It just lowers the threshold by which we're allowed to open up the, uh, the financial package to do that comparison. So I, 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 I support that, and I appreciate Councillor Zalka raising it. Um, and I put my, I'll just move to the, the notion of the piece here. Anybody else wish to speak, Councillor Appleton? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Just speaking on that amendment, um, I would not support that amendment. Uh, I, I take a somewhat opposing view uh, in that, and, and, I, and I recognize the rationale for why it's been made, uh, but I do place a very high uh, value on amenities for what is fundamentally public space. So, and it, and it is really the, uh, the, the most significant piece of public space that we have direct jurisdiction over in which we can be creative in this way and invite uh, people to really get uh, creative with their submissions. So, in my view, the scoring, the way that it's presented, uh, encourages uh, proponents to come forward with, with creativity and with vision and to pay attention to what the m community has said through the public consultation process. So in, in my view, the, obviously the financial component is, is equally important and that's why it's graded the way that it is. Uh, but I, I really think that the, lev the threshold being set where it is with respect to amenities will push a potential proponent into being very creative and, and, and really looking around the region at some of the creative things that are going on and, and, and presenting a way for, to make that happen. So that's just my view. Thank you, Councillor Appleton. Any other discussion? Uh, so we're voting on the amendment right now, which is to change the threshold from 70% to 50% for consideration of the financials. Uh, uh, and see no further discussion. All those in favor of the amendment uh, and all those opposed, uh, it falls on a tie, uh, fails on a tie, so uh, we're back to the original motion, which is to move it forward as it stands. Uh, any other discussion on the main motion? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor? And opposed, and opposed, thank you very much. So that'll come to council meeting, I believe, uh, should there's, since there's no real changes, should be easy enough to do to the uh, to have it ready for next week. So thank you, Miss Bay, very much for your work on this. Uh, nice to see this moving forward. I look forward very much to the process, and hopefully we get some really good uh, some really good proposals. Uh, just give us a moment here uh, for those watching at home or waiting outside. Uh, we're just going to sanitize the station again, and then move on to item number four, which is the second driveway access request for two zero seven two Neal Street. Um, as all of our Items on this agenda are open for uh, public 
uh, input. Uh, if there's anybody on the, that's at home and watching and wanting to provide, uh, ask questions or provide input on this application, this is again for second driveway access request 2072 Neal Street at a number four in the agenda. Please call our phone number at 250-598-3311. But it's 598-3311 and uh, you will be in a queue and we will take those, take that input. It does feel very much like a PBS broadcast at this point, I will say. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's fine. It's a public broadcaster, so it makes sense that this, we have to do this, yes. <laughs> It's almost like we should give out a DVD box set of like Ken Burns documentary here just as people coming in. Okay, I believe the station is ready. So if we could uh, invite the next, uh, is there a proponent in for uh, 2072 Neal Street? Put your, if you can put your mask on and, and then come in. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome and uh, thank you for our, our cumbersome process in a tight space to get people in here and uh, for your patience waiting outside uh, as we go through these things. So um, uh, welcome. If I could just start by, uh, uh, I'm just going to have Ms. Jensen, I believe, do an overview of this. No? Is who is speaking to... Uh, no, I'm just gonna. I think we have. We usually introduce these things from a, from a staff perspective of what the application is, and then we'll get to your to your, your worship. Uh, uh, the director of engineering and public works is on the line to be able to speak to that. Oh, right. It's a, it's considered an engineering issue, not a not a not a land use. So my apologies, um, uh, Mr. Haran, Are you on the phone? Uh, I am, and if you can hear me, I'm uh, I'll be ready to back ahead. Uh, we can we can hear you. If you could just speak up uh, slightly, that would be helpful. As we are. Uh, I will. We'll do my best to project. That sounds great, as you are right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haran. If you want to just give a quick overview of the, uh, of the application, then we'll, uh, we'll introduce the proponents, and we'll get to uh, questions from the council or from the committee. Thank you. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, 2072 Neal Street um, is, uh, is two lots at the same address, and the rear lot does not currently have access to the transportation network. So the owner is uh, re requesting a second driveway access, and the authority for approval uh, of such a driveway access uh, rests with council as per the driveway access bylaw. And there's a number of guidelines in the bylaw um, that guide whether a yes or no can be given for this kind of request uh, based on the frontage of less than 30.5 meters. Um, and some of those guidelines are if the second driveway is an only practicable means to address a short fall in the parking facilities bylaw, or if the second driveway is only practical means of allowing safe movement of traffic on and off uh, the parcel. And the report talks a bit about some of the other guidelines that are in the, uh, the bylaw to guide council in assessing uh, requests. Um, part of this uh, analysis that staff has done has, is to weigh in on some of these guidelines and then to uh, make some comments around the, uh, the zoning bylaw requirements um, for paved surfaces in terms of look and feel of uh, parcels from, uh, from the public perspective. Um, so in summary, um, we, uh, staff recommendation is that we do not see any significant negative impacts on safety and uh, um, uh, 
visual consistency in the neighborhood, uh, and there are some positive impacts uh, for the for the rear lot and, and enjoyment of that land. Uh, so staff recommendation at this time is to approve um, the, uh, the the request as per the report uh, that I provided. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Haran. And just in the interest of time, uh, we may or may not have to actually have you speak to this, depending on where uh, the committee sits uh, on this application. Uh, we have the recommendation in front of us. Are there questions of the applicant or staff? Uh, Councillor Braithwaite. Um, thank you, and through you, Mayor. Um, I was actually really surprised to see this come back um, to Council because I remember um, vividly when it came to Council as a, um, a proposal for a house on the second lot. Uh, so my question is, um, and this probably goes to staff, is, um, and, and thinking back to uh, 2018 when this came as a proposal of a house and it was turned down by the then council, um, and we had many um, residents, surrounding residents come out and speak against um, allowing a house on that lot. Um, my question to staff would be, um, is this kind of like putting the horse before the cart now? If we allow the driveway, then are we then our hands tied, obviously, to allow the house? Uh, thank you, Councillor Braithwaite. And that house, as I my recollection, had a large number of variants, which is why it came to this body in that time. This application has no variants, as I understand it, that's going through. But uh, Mr. Horan, I can give that to you and perhaps over to building and planning if that's necessary. But Mr. Horan? Uh, well, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I think I'll say a quick sentence or two, and I might pass it over to um, to building and planning to follow up. Uh, I guess it, the best way to say it is in uh, um, there's some changes in terms of what's being asked for this time around, and any uh, request for a second driveway access is not done. Uh, from a staff perspective, we analyze it in conjunction with um, uh, the analysis that's occurring uh, on the building and planning side. So it's not an independent, um, you know, it's, it's done in conjunction. So I think the best way, though, to weigh in on the differences between um, the, the previous applications and what's being looked at now is probably best. Uh, and I can't see anybody, so I can't tell if that if they're looking uh, happy for them passing this over, but maybe it's best to pass it over to building and planning, please. Uh, I, I'm happy to do that, and I'll go, I'm happy to go to the proponents as well to give a quick explanation, but um, are anybody from the building and planning department prepared to speak to the... Uh, yes, you can come over. Welcome, Ms. Jensen. If you could just, uh, yeah, turn your microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just as a bit of background, so uh, a development variance permit application came to council in early 2018. Uh, at that time, they were looking at uh, variances to setbacks on the rear lot to construct a new home. Uh, they were also looking at a variance to paved surface at that time for, for a second driveway to cross over the front property. Um, Councillor Braithwaite is correct. The council did uh, turn the application down at that time. So with, with the applicant moving now forward, looking for a second driveway access, that is now in front of council as to whether you want to say yes or no to that. Uh, that would not um, predicate any future decision. So if the applicants came back with a new development variance permit application, that is still separate than whether you allowed a second driveway access or not. Um, Ms. Jensen, if I may just for clarification, it is a separate legal lot. A second house can be built on that lot. Is that correct under the under the current zoning and bylaws? It's just the question here is whether we would allow a driveway back to that second house. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. It is a second legal lot. They can build a single family home on it. Uh, they can build a single family home on it strictly with a building permit if they're meeting all the requirements of the zoning bylaw. Okay, which includes a covered parking spot, I'm assuming, but not necessarily a driveway. Okay, <laughs> just for my clarification, thank you. Uh, yeah, Councillor Green. Oh, so, uh, Councillor Braithwaite, did you have any follow-ups? Um, okay, Councillor Green. No, go ahead, Councillor Green. Right, thank you. Um, and because I wasn't on council at that time, through you, Mayor, to Ms. Jensen, is this what is commonly known as a panhandle um, lot situation or not? Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Jensen. <laughs> Thank you for your worship. No, this is not a panhandle lot. They, this particular lot has no access to a street whatsoever. That's why they're requesting, uh, it would be an easement that runs across the front lot. So it's an agreement between the front lot and the back lot to use a portion of the front lot land as a driveway. Thank you very much, thank you. Thank you. Um, are there other questions of the uh, Councillor Zilka? Uh, thank you so much, Chair. Um, in the uh, plans, um, 
there's a, a new single family uh, dwelling uh, uh, outline uh, as well as an ex accessory carport. Um, uh, is that part of what we're discussing today or is this more illustrative uh, 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 as far as the staff is concerned? Ms. Jensen, the application here is for the driveway. At this point, we're not looking at the application of the house itself. Ms. Jensen, is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. I Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor. And um, through you to staff, maybe, I'm not sure if it's engineering or planning, but they'll figure it out, I'm sure. Uh, so in looking at this, that is a very long driveway. Um, it's about, I think I make out about 100 and almost 180 feet long, the driveway could be, because it's 120 for one lot and then um, about another 60 feet for the, for the other lot. Um, so for a car to go all the way down that length of driveway on the two strips and then have to get all the way to the end carport and then, what, reverse back out or ba at least reverse back out to the turnaround that is shown on the driveway? Um, I guess when, when uh, you know, it, it's presented in the report that this is, this is um, a safe transportation um, route, but I don't, that, that's a long way to drive, one direction and then reverse out all the way to the street because it's very, very close to the neighbor's driveway on the, uh, at the, on the adjacent property. Um, and somehow I, I would think that in order for this to, to work in a safe way, somehow that either a, a, turn, a different turnaround has to be established or, or perhaps some change of lot lines, but I'll this, just is, I'll this put is the question. Wrong. This is 180. Is it 180 feet long? I'm going to put that question. We have the proponents here, so might as well have you uh, jump in at this point and, and answer some questions. So um, to that point, uh, is, there, is there a mechanism by the, for which cars can turn around on that back lot and drive forwards back uh, out along the, the driveway? And if I can just ask you to state your name and municipality of residence or business. Uh, and just so you have to push the button to, before you speak. Thank you. Oh, that's my bad. Go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Rick Humphreys. I am the owner of the property. Uh, this is my uh, um, uh, father, who's also uh, the solicitor who's acting on my behalf, uh, David Humphreys. Um, so yes, the, uh, uh, the, the, the distance, the front lot is 120 feet, uh, and the rear lot is 60. Um, currently, um, you know, without, um, I think the issue here is, um, what can be allowed is for the front and the rear lot um, would have to share the same driveway. Um, so it, it, um, it's not an issue of, um, uh, so I guess what we're proposing is to, to have a second driveway. Um, so the, to, to keep the existing house to, uh, with its current driveway uh, and to allow for a second driveway access to, um, to, um, to feed into the rear lot. So, our, my concern, I think our main argument is that right now um, for our, to get approval for our building permit um, um, without asking for the second driveway is we'd have to actually share the same driveway. Um, the front house and the back house would have to share the same driveway. Um, and we just feel, uh, you know, um, that, um, you know, that uh, um, based on practicality, based on safety, um, um, that we uh, we feel like there's, we we would want a second driveway. Um, does that answer your question, uh, Mr. Humphreys? I think the question was for the second driveway: Is there a turnaround at the back that allows the that car coming out that second driveway to, to drive out face first, as as opposed to backing all the way down that long driveway? Yeah. yeah so the front of the um, the rear lot, uh, um, I have created a turnaround area. So as you um, come into the rear lot um, you can uh, turn around into an area into the front yard um, and reverse and that way when you come back down the driveway to the street um, you wouldn't be backing down the entire driveway 
Thank you, Mr. Humphreys. Uh, Mr. Councilor Patterson, any other questions? Yes, thank you, Mayor. The, um, the adjacent house um, to the east of this property also has their driveway along along there. So from uh, presenting an attractive, visible drive to the street, again, I'm failing to, to understand how, because the, the green belt will be gone, and so you're going to have just two, well, you have a long driveway on one side, and then you'll have the strips on the other side that will all be long driveway. And I, you know, I guess I question um, about the uh, the use of that, and then the driveway on the other side to the west. Um, it just seems like, a, to, in my opinion, at least, a lot of driveway space on on um, uh, to service these lots and and. Um, you know, I think even of getting emergency vehicles all the way down to this, although our director of engineering said that safety is not a factor, but, you know, if an emergency took place down there and trying to get uh, emergency vehicles and then get everything turned around again, I, I guess I'm not understanding quite how this will function well um, and long-term for the community. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Uh, Mr. Horan, um, is that a question you want to ask? Of the, so from an, from an emergency services perspective, is there any concern with the second driveway uh, running that length back to the back, uh, development of the back of a property? Uh, Your Worship, that's an excellent question. And uh, in the staff work that we've done, uh, I don't have that answer uh, just on, uh, to, to be able to report back to you. I'd need to go back and... Uh, and check with the team and, and report back on that specific issue. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm assuming even if this was recommended to move forward, then we'll leave that as an open question that should be answered prior to that, the final consideration of this, of the of the request. Uh, thank you. Anything else, Councillor Patterson? Thank you. Councillor Zelka? Uh, thank you so much, Chair. Uh, a question uh, for staff. Um, it could be engineering or building and planning, I'm not sure. But uh, the properties nearby, um, for example, uh, at, uh, uh, what's the number there on Google Maps? Uh, 2044, uh, just down the road, and also 2038 Neal Street. They have properties behind them, similar in some ways to this one, and they appear to have driveways of some sort. I was wondering, uh, from a compare and contrast, uh, what solution was done for those ones, and how is it different from this one? That would help me uh, a little bit to understand. Um, Ms., um, Mr. Anderson from uh, Building and Planning, a director of Building and Planning. Yeah, if I may, that's a scenario where you've got uh, two rear lots that have joined to have a single access point, uh, if you will, through the through the middle of the um, the lots in front of them. So you you end up with um, driveways for each of the houses in the front, and then a single driveway that serves the two back lot houses for that particular property. Thank you, Councillor Zelka. Uh, Councillor uh, Braithwaite and Councillor Green. Um, thank you. And just going back to something that Councillor Patterson said, I, I would be very interested to know um, whether or not a um, fire engine, for example, could either have a, a hose that would reach 160 feet down a driveway to a house or could actually fit down that driveway. So that would be a very good question to know. And then the, my other... Um, question, and I'm not sure who this will go to, but um, on in the staff report at the bottom of page two, it says the maximum allowed for each is 25%, and they're talking about um, the the um, uh, hard surface. And on one lot, it's 19.1, and the other, it's 24.7. And it says in order to meet these hard surface maximums, paving strips are proposed for the existing driveway and for the new driveway. So they're going to take out the hard surface driveway and put in paving that that's there already and put in paving strips. But it then goes on to say that um, uh, Further paving or expansion of paved services to a full driveway, for example, would not be permitted in the future without an offset reduction in paved services. And so my question is, how would you offset paved, the paved surfaces that were there already? Like, would you, how, would, how would you take away part of a driveway in, a, in order to be able to add paved services somewhere else? 
I'll go to staff on that one, I think, or I can go, if they don't have the ready answer, I'll go to the proponent. Um, Mr. Horan? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I think the, que the, the answer to the question, if, I'm, if I understand correctly, is you know, how to uh, how to make changes in the future. And I guess the the analysis that we provided in terms of percentages and the recommendation around uh, yes, it meet the the proposal. So the the site plan drawing that's shown in, uh, as an attachment to the report, uh, and the calculation is done around the zoning bylaw and the hard surfaces means that as you see the drawing there, so with the paving strips. Um, the, they, it's compliant, but if the future residents or current owners in the future decide that they want to make some changes to um, how much paved surfaces there is, then it would no longer be compliant. So they would have to make some kind of significant changes, either remove a driveway or remove some of the paved surfaces or, or, or something to, to make it work. Um, and at the moment, though, the, what you see is the maximum in terms of uh, uh, allowable um, in terms of the bylaw uh, guidance. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Horan. Thanks. Good. Uh, Councillor Green? Yes, thank you. Th through you, Mayor, to um, Ms. Jensen. Just, just to, I have two questions and then um, just an observation. The, the first one is that the easement uh, proposed would run with the land, not with the owner. Is that correct? Ms. Jensen? Oh, we've we've kicked you out of our amplified sound. If you just if you just give an answer, I will I will I will repeat it, Ms. Jensen. Yeah. For those at home, their easement runs with the land. Uh, the municipality actually is a third party signer of that easement covenant, essentially a covenant for that, so it stays with the land. Thank you. And through you to the proponents, have you had feedback from your neighbors on this particular proposal? Uh, Mr. Humphreys? Yeah, uh, are we working here? Yeah. Um, no, I, I haven't had any feedback. Um, I ha no. Have you consulted with your neighbors by any chance? Uh, no, I haven't. Okay, thank you. Um, and my third point is that shared driveways are not uncommon in Oak Bay. Um, so it's, that's just a point in terms of, of sharing a driveway. It's, it's, it's not an uncommon observation from my point of view. I've, I've noticed a number of properties that have shared driveways. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Green. Um, any Councillor Appleton? <coughs> Well, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just a, a couple of quick questions, um, hopefully a, a quick and in quick su succession. So picking up on Councillor Green's comments, uh, registering the uh, easement for the driveway immediately adjacent to the ad adjacent parcel does not require the permission of the adjacent landowner. Do I have that correct? Uh, Ms. Jensen? So the answer for those at home is that the easement does not uh, require the approval of the neighbors. This is an agreement of the landowners themselves. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure whether this is a, a <laughs> whether it's staff in various departments or whether it's of the proponent. But I note that on the plan, uh, a fence is shown for at least part of the length of the proposed driveway. I'm just wondering that if this is an easement and a driveway that's created immediately adjacent to the property line of the adjacent property, which and there is a driving surface as is noted, um, I would think that it would be important to have a visual, like a, a physical barrier to ensure that if you're driving down that, that you don't actually cross lot lines inadvertently. So is the fence uh, proposed and necessary? Is it, would it be mandated by staff or is it just something that exists in the ether? Uh, because I think that as a, on, on a safety basis, that would be important. Um, uh, thank you, Councillor Appleton. I don't know that is something we would. Uh, I'll just go to the applicants. So is there yeah, is there expected to be a, a fence along that that line? Do you mind if I just uh, so yeah? If I could comment on that, comment on that, and I have and comment on a, a couple other things as well. Um, yeah, there there certainly will be a fence along the property. Um, of course, as per bylaws, um, the the fence will be built on my property, so it won't be on the neighbor's property, it won't be down the middle property line. 
it will be built on my property. So it will be legal. Um, and yes, I plan, we, we plan to have a fence um, between me and my neighbor. Um, on that point as well, um, with regards to your question about chatting with the neighbors, um, Councilor Green, I, um, so no, I haven't chatted with this one particular neighbor yet. Um, so with the, um, with having, the way it stands now, um, if I'm allowed to build, which I'm not asking for variances, um, so the, the permit looks like it could be um, approved without coming here. And I guess the reason why I'm coming here is because um, I would like to have the two driveway crossings at the front. Um, and so with regards to the neighbors, um, you know, I guess the other option is if this, if this is denied is that um, the front property and the rear property has to use the same driveway uh, to their covered parking spaces. Um, and in my opinion, that really um, hurts the neighbors um, because you have double the amount of cars, you have double, double the amount of traffic uh, that's going down this uh, shared driveway, uh, which will cause extra noise. Um, so I think it's a big win for uh, for my neighbors in that um, there isn't double the amount of traffic. Um, the other thing that's really big here Sorry, is... I'm just going to interrupt for a second, mm -hmm. Mr. Humphreys. Yeah. You, if you guys are in the same bubble, you're welcome to take off your mask while you're at the table. We just need it when okay. you're walking in and out. You look uncomfortable, so... Uh, <laughs> here. Thanks. Yeah, we've still got a big enough gap there, I think. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you, Hugh, for trying to fix that, that microphone. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Humphreys. Yeah, thanks. So, um, yeah, I, I think that, so, yeah, so just to, to go along those lines of, of, of it's, a, it's a big thing for, um, it'll, it'll cut down on, uh, on noise disturbances, f certainly for my neighbors, because we're going to have, um, you know, if this isn't approved, we're going to have uh, two families sharing the same driveway, which will be extra cars going down this driveway. Um, 120 to 180 feet. Whereas what I'm asking for uh, is to keep the existing driveway, which goes into the current house, and have a separate, uh, call it exclusive driveway, for the rear property. Um, not not necessarily a, a panhandle, but via an easement. Um, and because of this, you'll have a much less um, uh, much less um, uh, traffic, um, which, which again, more traffic, more cars, uh, creates a really big safety issue. Um, my concern is having, if you're having double the amount of cars to, to go along this one driveway, um, again, just for safety, whether there be children on the driveway, um, whether people are walking and that sort of thing, whether when one car is coming home and the other car wants to leave, and if you can picture them literally one car coming home, the other car leaving, they meet in the middle, and now what? Does the first car have to back out onto Neal Street? I think it creates a very big safety issue. So, so what I'm presenting is, is, um, uh, is to have a separate driveway for both properties, and that way the rear property can take its own uh, driveway, which, which eliminates any kind of major uh, practicality and safety issues. Um, and of course, council can vote on this, um, um, due to the clear issues of practicality and safety, which is required to, to be present for Section 12.2 uh, of the bylaw of 3550 uh, uh, to be applied. Um, the, the last point I want to make, too, is that if there was, um, you know, if there was just one driveway that was being used, um, if you can picture whoever lives in the front house, the, the front house is, is fairly close to the street, so do they want to take this driveway 100 and approximately 100 to 110 feet all the way back and then have to go into a carport or a driveway that will have to be, sorry, carport or a garage, which will have to be built in the front house's backyard? Um, probably not. I have a feeling that they would end up just parking on the street, which in my opinion would cause a lot more uh, street congestion. Um, so I... I picture the front property not actually using that driveway and just parking on the street, which I think just uh, isn't a great uh, thing. Uh, another point too is, uh, is, is if I had to build a garage, um, so if this wasn't approved, I would have to, um, with a shared driveway, build a garage in the front property's 
backyard, a garage or a carport, because I need a covered parking space. Um, it would be built uh, right near a, a bylaw protected cedar tree. Uh, so it would be more, uh, there would be construction, there would be more paving um, all around the root zone of this bylaw protected cedar tree, um, which I think is also a, a fairly big negative. Um, and then the last point I want to make is just the, uh, yeah, uh, um, having feedback from Director of Engineering, uh, Danny Horan, um, agreeing with um, uh, or just recommending that uh, that this go through based on you know safety and practicality, et cetera. So, yeah, thanks. May I say something? Uh, you may. We're just uh, going to keep this reasonably short to try to get through the our, okay. our agenda here. So. What do I have to push something, Rick? Or no, you're fine. Just go ahead and speak naturally. Can you, can you, we can just hear to you answer fine. your question, you asked whether it, the you just address, neighbors... address your comments just through me, if you don't mind. Okay. Yes, thank there you. There was a question on your left as to uh, whether the neighbors had been consulted. Uh, and, and he said that they haven't been consulted. The, uh, the neighbor to the west isn't affected at all because, I mean, she's just not. The person to the right could be affected, but in a positive way. That's the one to the east. Mm -hmm. Because if we're forced to have two, two, uh, one driveway access for two houses, there's double the cars and double the noise to the lady or whoever is to the right, okay? With two driveway access, that, that's better for her. The house, the, the property to the, the back, he owns, and there's the property to the west isn't affected. Uh, I just want to say one other thing, too, because Section 12, subsection 1. You can just step back from the microphone a little bit. Yeah, I'm okay. just getting a bit loud there. Thanks. Se section 12, subsection 1 was around since about 1987 or so, and you could have only one driveway access for one lot, Okay. And then, in, and then in 1996, it was changed, and you could have a second driveway access, section 12, subsection 2, provided you could have a second driveway access, provided that there was 15 meters between the uh, center points of the two driveways, which would then preclude any 50-foot lots from having two driveways. It was then amended. The gentleman behind here, he referred to property down the way on Neal, um, I wouldn't mind having that clarify what he said. Um, but the bylaw was changed again in 2001. So 12 subsection 2, which is in the binder, which has been provided, um, allows to get around to 12 subsection 1, which says only one driveway access, which would be a bit of a gong show to have all these cars and stuff going up and back on one 10-foot strip. 12 subsection 2 allows you to have a second driveway if it's practical and if it's safe. And Mr. Horn has said in his, in his presentation, or his recommendation, that it is safer and practical that 12 subsection 2 be utilized to allow two separate driveways. It's just safer and more practical. Um, so that's the reason for that. And the gentleman behind referred to, I'm not sure what you said back there, but um, I could certainly comment on his if he raised it again. Uh, that's fine. I'm, I'm, I think, I think I, maybe I'm just going to draw this back to the core aspect of what we're talking about here tonight. So we have an application here. Uh, there are two legal lots. There's a legal ability to build a home at the back lot. Uh, the consideration here is are we going to, as this body, uh, uh, move forward with uh, allowing a second driveway uh, for access to that secondary house, uh, lot at the back of the lot? Um, you were, uh, the, the references to the bylaws, everything else, were, the, the report's clear, it's allowable. Um, it meets certain criteria at the end of the day this body has to make a decision about whether or not we want to approve that that design uh, and appreciate the the clarification in terms of what uh, the reasons for having a second driveway as opposed to uh, removing the the existing driveway and, and moving everything to a secondary driveway with a, a covered parking spot in the back of the first house so I think we're all pretty clear on the facts of this right now uh, Councillor Green yeah, I, I just have one question for clarification. Looking at the photograph of the two lots, there is quite a bit of green space around the homes and the lots themselves. So I'm just wondering, um, through you, Mayor, to the proponent or to Ms. Jensen, um, what, what kind of clearing or tree cutting would be involved in installing this second driveway? Because I would think that your neighbors on either side would appreciate the green space that's there now. Um, Let's just ask the I question, we'll just get to the question. Are there any trees being removed uh, under the design that's being proposed here for the driveway? Um, there, mm, I, I haven't looked at the design for a while, the landscape design, but no, like, 
there's there's a, a there's a small hedge and a couple small bushes. Um, there is a one bylaw protected cedar, um, which I know that uh, the municipality will certainly. Um, I have to work with an arborist to make sure that the cedar in the root zone is protected when I install the driveway. Um, but that first lot, um, the first 120 feet, um, other than some bushes um, and maybe one plum tree, um, there there isn't anything else. Okay, thank you. Thank uh, you. And I'll go to staff as well. Is there any other? Is that uh, is that accurate, or have we have we had that review? It's just there's not an arborist report. This is an engineering uh, report, Mr. Anderson. Yeah, I would just comment that at the building permit stage, uh, we would be looking at. Uh, any impacts on trees as part of the building permit process for, okay. for the proposed house? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Humphreys, I just, you just turn off your microphone when we're not having you actively speak because we're picking Fine. up your site conversation at the same time. Uh, Councillor Green, did that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Zelka and then Braithwaite. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, I, I just wanted to ask uh, um, staff, I, I'm, I'm sure they've gone through all the possible permutations in terms of other uh, options that might be available. And I wanted to ask, um, there uh, might be partially hypothetical. I don't know whether this would be allowed. I, 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 I hope the, the chair will indulge me. But with respect to um, uh, the, the answer I got earlier on about a shared driveway uh, just, just down the street on Neil to uh, make available some lots behind those other houses just down the, ray, down the road, um, I, I, I wonder, uh, and I'd like to ask staff their opinion, uh, uh, if it's possible to put a driveway straddling a lot line. And the reason I ask this is that appears between 2072 and 2064 that there appears to be three meters between the two houses. However, the lot line's right in the middle. Uh, is, could we provide, th theoretically, if the proponent was willing to look at that potential option, a, dr a shared driveway between the house, uh, the, the proponent, and the proponent to the, uh, to the west? Uh, is that possible uh, under our bylaws? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll allow the question, but I think it's a very hypothetical question at this point. I mean, unless the applicant is applying for that, it's sort of a, a moot point <laughs> at this point. Well, the, the reason I ask is that is, if, if, if it is a viable option, um, and uh, and you know, one of our uh, desires is to have uh, as much as many legal lots, you know, with houses on them. There's two le empty lit lots behind both of those houses. It might be uh, to their potential uh, advantage for them to go into uh, something together. But I, but if it's not legal, then they can't even talk about it. So I don't know whether it's even legal or not, or whether we, we could allow it or not to have a driveway that straddles a lot line. Uh, Mr. Anderson, I think it would be an application process, I assume, Mr. Anderson? Yeah, I, I would just say that that is possible. Um, so I think that's... So I'm going to go to the proponents. I'm going to move this along as fast as I can here to the proponents. I, I'm, is that something you want to, to look at? Uh, because this way we have an application in front of us here. No, yeah. no, okay. we don't. Yeah, we don't so know. Let's deal with yeah. the application we have in front of us. Thank you, Councillor Zelka. Anything else, uh, Councillor Zelka? Anything else to follow up? Okay, thanks, uh, Councillor Breathwaite. Um, thank you. So um, I, I'm going to ask this question first, and then I'm going to explain why I'm asking this question. If this um, application was denied, what would be the process for reapplying? Um, in the future, how long of a time lag? Because I know that we normally have a, a waiting period before reapplying for an, um, for another or you, you're putting forward another application. Uh, Mr. Horan, is this a six months uh, before you can ask again? Is that the the timeline, Mr. Uh, you have me stumped on that question. I actually don't know the answer. Uh, Mr. Mr. Anderson may know. Mr. Anderson, is this is an engineering question? Does it have the same timelines as the building up? Uh, not to my knowledge, Your Worship. The land use applications have the like the development permits, rezonings have the six month, but to my knowledge, the driveway access does not fall under that same uh, procedure. Thank you, uh, Councillor Breathway. Um, and the reason I ask that is because, um, honestly, I mean, I agree that you, um, I understand that you have the, the right to, to put a, a house on that lot or the, the proponents have the right to put a house on that lot. I would feel a lot more comfortable um, putting this, uh, shelving this um, application right now and having the um, uh, proponents talk to their neighbors and having a little bit of input from their neighbors around this um, before I would be able to um, kind of move this forward. Um, and I, I, I hearken back to the, um, the meeting from 2018 where there was minimum of eight of the neighbors in from this exact area um, who came out and spoke against that 
um, original proposal of the house that the proponents had. I understand that the new house that they have is not going to have any variances, so it's allowed to be on that lot, but I would just feel a lot more comfortable um, having n knowing that the um, surrounding neighbors had been uh, talked to before this, uh, before we would approve a driveway in here. So I would hate for um, this, this application to be denied. I'm not sure how the other people around this table feel. I feel that I couldn't actually support it, um, but I, I would hate for it to be denied and then them not have the ability to come back for six months. I would rather have it tabled and allow them to talk to the neighbors and come back in two weeks. Uh, thank you, Councilor Braithwaite. Uh, Councilor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor, and through you two staff, um, could I have clarification on what constitutes a driveway and what constitutes a parking pad? Because when I look at the second driveway, I believe it's more of a parking pad than, than a driveway. Um, I'll ask the yeah. question. Um, I think that I'll go to Mr. Anderson, I think, on that. On that. Your Worship, can I just clarify um, which driveway the Council Patterson is referring to? Is it the one serving the existing house the, or the, the proposed? It's the one serving the existing house, Mr. Anderson. Mm -hmm. so, so that a, a driveway is an access to a parking spot. In this case, it's to, uh, my understanding, to a garage. So that's a driveway to the garage, and then there's a parking spot. It can be used for parking, as we know. Driveways are used the same but it would be considered a driveway um, serving that. I just want to move us along here in the course of this thing. I'm, I, I don't, I'm not going to probably take any more comments. I think unless there's any more questions attached to this. I just want to, I'll get a motion and there may be some questions that follow up with it. Uh, Mr. Humphreys, do you want to add one last? Yeah, just one more quick thing. Um, uh, and it, it's a good point. Uh, when I was applying for, uh, for a bunch of variances several years ago, um, I, you know, there were a few neighbors that weren't for it, although after several, dropping off several letters, no one really got back to me. So um, it, it, it was a little bit of a, a shock when they showed up and, uh, and surprised me there because I did try to reach out to them. Um, what's interesting is the, the one neighbor that was for me that did not show up is the neighbor that's directly to the east. So that's the one where I would, I would have a driveway, a shared driveway, um, or sorry, hopefully not a shared driveway, that would be going along... Um, the, her entire 120 feet. Um, so sh she was the only one that um, was for it and did not show up um, and did not sign. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Humphreys. I'll leave it there. I just want to get to the core of this discussion and get to a, a, a motion and to a discussion and to a decision because we have a lot of other things on our agenda. So, Councillor Green. Just one very quick question through you to the proponent. In the 2018 application, was there a second driveway proposed like this as well? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Green. No. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to, I didn't realize this; it was possible. Um, so, um, my my father pointed out that uh, um, of this bylaw change that occurred in two thousand one, um, which is why we're here today to ask for it. But at that time, a couple of years ago, I didn't re I didn't realize it was possible. Otherwise, I I would have asked for it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Humphreys. Uh, back to this table, we need, uh, if no more questions, uh, I'd like to get to a motion and we can speak to the motion. Uh, the motion uh, would either be to recommend to council or to some other direction uh, as council or as committee sees fit. Elsa Patterson. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I'm, I am concerned about the safety aspects of this, so I would like to make a motion that this be referred back to staff so that we can verify um, uh, any safety issues related to what is proposed before we make a final decision. I, I think procedurally we can, I mean this, this body doesn't have to move it forward, we can refer it back, but we have to be very clear about what the the referral was for and I would also just point out for, for basic questions like that if that's the contingency then that that information could come back to the next to the council meeting it wouldn't have to come back to future committee of the whole if that was the will I, I'm very happy to take a motion if the if the if the will is to move it forward contingent upon those being addressed then I think that's probably a cleaner motion than, than referring it uh, back to staff uh, 
Councilor Zelka. Um, I'm I, I can't support uh, the motion as it uh, as it stands. So I would uh, move option number two, that uh, we recommend that the uh, second driveway be denied. Is there a seconder for that motion? Second. Uh, Moved and seconded. Thank you, uh, Councillor Braithwaite. Uh, I, I, again, I, I mean, I wish I would have put on a, a table motion because I think that you deserve um, the um, the ability to talk to your neighbors and come back to this table as quickly as possible. Because I think that um, you know, again, you are obviously allowed to build a house on that property is uh, uh, within uh, as long as you're not asking for any variances and 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 we. We have no say in that. Um, so I would really honestly like to table this um, application. If, 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 the, if the proponents are, are willing to do that, I mean, it, it's something that I guess would be up to them. If they're not willing to, to go away and come back in two weeks, um, then, then I'll, I'll agree with the motion to deny. But if... I mean, I, I'm just going to go over to our staff here just to understand what our options are here. Um, Motion to decline is an odd one to table because <laughs> uh, it's essentially not doing anything. But uh, and I think we have to be very careful about a motion to table because I think we have to be understood clear what we're expectations are coming back here of that we sort of usually contingent upon something. So, uh, Council or uh, Ms. Hopkins, I don't know if you if you want to dive in here in terms of from a process perspective. Um, I, I'm, I'm not terribly comfortable with motions to table, if given that the motion currently is to decline. Uh, that would have to fail in my book, and then we go back to a motion to approve and then table that subject to some other information. Um, Ms. Hopkins? Your Worship, that, that's what I would recommend. Um, and this would not be a tabling motion. This would be to postpone. Sorry, right, be able to, to postpone the discussion. Um, but right now, the motion on the table is to decline the application. I, I, at this point, it's, it's a discussion at this table, so... Uh, we'll take that here unless there's any further questions. So, uh, Councillor Zelka, you uh, made the motion. So, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, hearing staff say that there is no restriction on uh, the proponent coming forward with another proposal, uh, uh, no, no timeline limit, gives me a, a, a solace in, in that they're not blocked like they in, in other situations, uh, from uh, from a bylaw perspective, and from from from. Uh, where I'm coming from is that there appears to be a perfectly viable solution on the other side of the property uh, as long as the other uh, property owner agrees. Uh, um, and and th for that reason, uh, I, I, I think it would be quite reasonable to have a single driveway instead of two separate driveways. Uh, if, uh, uh, however, it would involve talking to neighbours and coming up with some way of compromise. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Zelka. Uh, really, unless there's a question back to you, I can't take you back at this table. We're just now at this at this committee having a discussion. Uh, it's not on. But I just I, I understand your desire, but we're just we have to keep it at this table at this point. We're 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 now at this point. You just can't go to the neighbor and ask them. So I, I, I put I, an easement over his property. I, I understand that. It's sir. his own property. We'll, we'll let us have this discussion here. I understand the the piece. Um, we have a motion here to decline. Is there any anybody else who wishes to speak to this motion at this time? Councillor Appleton, you, you seconded. Do you want to you look at you and look at that to speak? Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. And, and I'll be brief. Um, you know, I make reference to the bylaw and the language that it uses in terms of councillors or how council may consider an exemption in this case. And we've talked about the safety aspect. But the first component that's mentioned in that bylaw about council's consideration is, is whether or not the exemption will substantively, substantially affect the use and enjoyment of adjacent land. And that hasn't been brought up to this point. So when we talk about the, 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 the nebulousness or the sort of the, 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 the non-regulatory uh, aspect of approaching neighbours and whether or not approaching a neighbour is, is necessary in a given state, in, in my opinion, at this point, I'm not satisfied that I cannot say that it will, will not substantively affect the use and enjoyment of adjacent land. It, in, this is a new permanent structure immediately adjacent to their land. And I'm not saying that, as, as Councillor Braithwaite has referenced, that those issues can't be worked out or those issues can't be discussed with the landowner and a mutually agreeable solution arrived upon. I think that that's eminently possible. But in terms of considering this individual motion, I unfortunately have to support 
the de to the motion to deny because I'm not convinced that we can say that it will not substantively affect the neighbor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Appleton. I'm not. Uh, I just I'll, I'll throw my two cents in here since uh, I don't see any other hands up at this point. I, I'm not going to support the motion and just for two primary reasons. And I take the point uh, points made quite well. Um, one, I thought I don't think we can hold any applicant to the what if scenario of a secondary straddling type piece. I think that's a very high bar to set to ask that you go and make a partnership agreement with another body to straddle a property line on something. I just don't think that's viable. So we have to treat this on the, on the face of it. Um, and I have to set aside the merits of the house in the backyard and all those pieces. Uh, if I look at the, what's in the, in the best interest of that lot, uh, it makes sense to me that um, the second longer, all the safety issues, everything else that's there is the one that will be built in this scenario. So the question is really not even the discussion about the long driveway, it's about the short driveway. And are we going to require that short driveway to be removed or not? And to my mind, there's an existing garage on that house uh, that's there, and there's an existing driveway. Um, to my mind, uh, the best scenario here is to leave that intact um, and allow the second driveway, which is going to get built in any case if the house is built, uh, to go forward. Uh, it simplifies the design. It minimizes the paving on the backyard. Uh, where an additional pad would have to be put down for the back for that house. Um, all those sort of components. So I, I think if we just set us tease it out a bit, the it's still the best option that we have for us. So I don't support the, the motion to decline. I think at this case, I'd be much more comfortable with the motion to approve, but subject to confirmation of the safety aspects uh, from the from the fire department and the other and the other pieces. So uh, that's my two cents on this piece. Uh, any other comments? Seeing none, uh, the motion here is to decline the application. Uh, uh, so I'll call that question. All those in favor and opposed? I'm opposed. Uh, so that uh, that carries. So at this point, that is the application is now dead. A reapplication could be made. Um, and we have no timelines attached to that, but I think there would have to be some additional information in terms of uh, uh, information from neighbors and probably some safety aspects brought forward to this table for that consideration to happen. So uh, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> The options uh, were, it sounds like now the, 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 the house that's existing will now have its driveway on the east side, so what I, which I, is I suggest the same is, easement as the other one. So, so Mr. Humphreys, I'm yes. just going to ask, so this is not the place to try and answer all those questions. Oh. I, I just suggest that you, uh, following up tomorrow, speak with our staff and get an understanding of what that what the options are, uh, and they can help you with that portion of it. I, I, this is not the body to kind of, what if those scenarios, or to do a detailed design for options, and I uh, apologize for that, but I also have to get through this meeting, so uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, we are gonna move on to uh, 3000 Valdez Place. Uh, again, we'll take a moment here to wipe down the, uh, the space here, so we have safety for the applicants coming in. So for anybody who's watching at home, as we're doing the wipe down <laughs> procedures here for the next uh, next applicant, uh, we are on item number five, uh, advisory design panel uh, uh, for Upland setting and design for 3000 Valdez Place. Again, that's item number five. The call-in number, 250-598-3311. That's 250-598-3311. Uh, and uh, we'll call on you uh, as we, uh, if, if anybody wishes to call in um, on the on any app on this application, and we'll continue to do that as we move through. Uh, we have uh, just an hour left to get through the balance of these, so I do want to get through these as uh, in a reasonably expedient fashion. Do I? Okay. Hello and welcome. 
And we have a safe place for you to sit. Uh, thank you for your patience in, in, in sitting outside. Um, and uh, if, as you get yourself settled, you're allowed to take off your mask. And we're just going to have our staff do a, uh, a quick overview of this application. And I bless. Oh, sorry, Councillor Zelker's not back yet. We'll just wait for him uh, as, we, as we do that. Uh, perhaps we'll just get you to, to state your name for the record while we're waiting to start. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Bianca Bodley from Biophilia Design Collective. I'm the landscape designer for 3000 Valdez, and I'm here representing the client and the builder. Um, and uh, the architect, uh, Ted Levis, will be calling in from um, Mark Finley Architects, um, and so he'll be ready to answer questions regarding the the building and the overview on the project and I'll be happy to answer any questions regarding the exterior and the landscape and we're excited to be here tonight. Thank you Ms. Bodley and welcome. Uh, we're going to start this off more officially now uh, and again for anybody watching at home we are on item number five, 3000 Valdez Place. Uh, there will be an opportunity if you're interested in, in any feedback you can dial in 250-598-3311 and uh, we'll queue you up uh, for that point. Ms. Jensen please uh, go ahead. Thank you your worship. Um, this particular property is a vacant lot that's sitting on the Valdez Place cul-de-sac. It's also adjacent to the Uplands Park, so it's essentially in their rear yard. Uh, the applicant is proposing to build a new single-family home of a French Baroque design with high-quality materials, including fieldstone cladding, limestone detailing, and oak windows. The home would be built to level three of the BC Energy Step Code. The siting has been selected to have the least impact on the existing trees. It would include removing the removal of three trees and installing 12 new trees onto the site, including six Gary Oaks. Some of these would be planted along the border with the Uplands Park to provide more of a uh, natural flow between the park and the property and promoting the park-like setting. With the addition of those trees, a 45% tree canopy cover will be achieved, which meets the requirements of the Tree Protection Bylaw. The advisory design panel reviewed this application at their September meeting and were supportive of the application. They did note that this was a larger home and suggested the owner consider additional sustainability measures in addition to the energy step code and the proposed geothermal heating. Staff have also reviewed the application with respect to site characteristics and the neighborhood. The home itself would be built on the western portion of the site where the central portion of the home is bookended uh, on each side, one by the garage and one by the indoor pool. All aspects of the proposal are compliant with both the zoning bylaw regulations and the uplands design guidelines. All heights and setbacks are adhered to and no variances are required. Staff are requesting council direction. Uh, thank you, Ms. Jensen. Uh, welcome, Ms. Bodley. And, and sorry, who is, is it Mr. Findlay was on the line as well, is that correct? Uh, Ted Levis. Ted Levis, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and is he on the line now, Ms. Hopkins? <laughs> do, we, do we know? <laughs> oh. I believe so, and if I move my laptop, we won't be able to <laughs> okay. hear him. <laughs> we'll assume he's there to answer any questions if we need him, but let's get to the... Uh, to the committee first to see if there's uh, if there are any questions of the applicant or of staff on this application. Uh, are there any questions, Councillor Braithwaite? Um, thank you, and through you, Chair, um, I'm wondering how much blasting will take place um, in regards to this uh, building. Uh, Ms. Wadley, so you're probably are, are you suited to answer that question, or would you rather have Mr. Levis answer that question? Uh, Ted would be great, Mr. Levis. Okay, um, Mr. Levis, if you're on the line, uh, are you able to answer the question of? Uh, of the level of, of rock removal on the on the property. If you're speaking, we can't hear you, so we may have a. Uh, oh, Ms. Ms. Hopkins. Uh, if you are speaking, we are unable to hear you, so you will need to hit uh, star six to unmute yourself. I can speak to part of that. Um, the um, so Dick, the client's representative, okay. other representative is outside because of COVID. Um, so we're trying to call him on his That's cell fine. phone. We can, um, we can come back to the question as well yeah, later. But uh, What I can say is that the site right now is, is vacant and there was a house there, which is not there anymore. And the house will be sited 
um, quite low, uh, just based on the topography of the site. So it has, uh, as you approach the um, the western side, the Uplands Park, it's quite a bit higher than the actual site. So um, what you'll see from the park is going to be just the top story. And so it'll be sitting on the existing pad. And I don't believe there's going to be a significant amount of lasting, certainly around the pool area, they would need to be. But most of the house is sitting on the existing um, area foundation. Ms. Braithwaite. Thank you, and, and, and that actually asked, answered my, my next question, which was uh, I was a little bit worried about the visual from the park side, but knowing that it's um, that only one story is going to be showing from the park side um, makes me feel a little bit better because this is a very, very, very large house. Um, and, um, and, and I say that knowing that it is within our bylaw, but then also looking at uh, 0.39 FAR and a 24.8% lot coverage, um, which means to me, um, sadly, that in the future, if anybody wanted to make any um, augmentations to that design, that their hands would really be tied because they don't really have, they ha there hasn't been any wiggle room left to be able to, um, you know, add something here or, or something there without coming to us for a variance. And so um, even though it's within the, the bylaw, I just, I wish it had been just a teensy bit smaller perhaps, but yeah. Um, and I, I would be interested to hear about more sustainable measures um, as per the uh, comments from the ADP. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, oh. Am I am I coming through? You are, Mr. Levis, and welcome to the meeting. I apologize. I couldn't get you off of mute. No problem. Thank you for uh, allowing me to speak today. And if I could quickly touch on the blasting of the first question, um, the existing, the current footprint is absorbing some of the previous footprint of the building that was previously demolished. So the amount of blasting in the area in question, their, their previous footprint is kind of right in that location. Uh, so we don't anticipate to be um, that much blasting. And um, we are kind of anticipating more of a shoring, uh, protecting the roots of that oak tree that are in close proximity to that. So an arborist would be on site and uh, blasting wouldn't be required at that, at that location. Thank you, Mr. Levis. And just if I could just ask, I know it's probably loud enough at your end. Just the way that we have our audio set up here, you're you're a little faint. Um, those in the room can hear you, but probably those at home are, are straining a bit to understand to hear what you're saying. So if you could just speak up a little bit, I appreciate it's very late where, where you're at. Uh, but uh, so hopefully you're not going to wake up your your family as you're speaking to us. But if you could just uh, keep your voice up a little bit, that would be great. Uh, okay. Thank I you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, Councillor Braithwaite? Uh, Councillor Appleton? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Just to follow up on that point, um, and just for clarification from staff, I, I, I note in the arborist's report that he refers to a foundation excavation that will come west towards one of the protected trees and, quote, go down four meters into bedrock that will have to be blasted, unquote. Um, so that... Four meters seems like a lot of blasting, um, which seems kind of out of step with what we just heard. So I'm kind of wanting to get a better angle on well, is is the, it? Yeah, this is this is what our staff is saying, but I'm not sure what it's based on. So I just want to get clarification on that. Uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Just Levis, so I can reiterate. I, there's a uh, this existing survey is on page as part of the submittal for the Arborist report. Um, and you'll be able to see the existing or the demolished footprint of the previous structure that used to be on site. So if there were to be some blasting depth based on the depth of the, of the proposed foundation, uh, it wouldn't be sufficient. I mean, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be um, we'll find out when we get closer and start excavating and the arborist is there, but I don't, we don't anticipate too much blasting. I mean, the means and methods, I would like to offer up to our, uh, our builder just because he has better eyes on what's happening on the ground, but I don't, we don't anticipate per our conversations with the arborist and with the builder that blasting would be as severe as, as, as anticipated. Okay, thank you, Mr. Levis, for that answer. Councillor Appleton. 
Well, thank you, Worship. It's not really a question. It's just I, I, I have trouble with that just from the perspective of the, the plans provide for, you know, the, the, the mean, you know, the mean elevation of the site and the, the, the construction level, like the, the corner posts have, have their elevation set and, and we know what the elevation of the current site is. So I, I'm just thinking that there should be some, given the, the overall height of the building, the, the depth, the, well, the floor plan that's proposed, uh, I think it should be possible to get at least a, an order of magnitude idea of, of how much, uh, essentially how much blasting, how much rock's gonna need to come out of that site. Um, and, and I appreciate being, being raised because uh, you know, council is well aware of the sensitivity about this in the community. Um, and, and I think that it, it, it behooves us to have a fairly strong idea of what, again, what an order of magnitude idea of how much material is coming off the site. I don't know if we have the ability to have that answer at this meeting. Um, if, that's a, if that's a criteria for approval um, going to council, then I think that would be the, uh, that would be appropriate to, to, con to ask for that information to be provided. But at this point, it doesn't sound like we were able to answer that question in detail. Uh, and I guess I would ask that if we, if that's a request, that should be a criteria of decision making, not just out of curiosity, um, as, as just for as a piece. But Councillor Green. Thank you. I was at the meeting. As, as you know, I'm the liaison to um, the ADP. I actually appreciate uh, Councillor um, Appleton's question. Um, it was one that, w that, that did come up. Um, and there are two things, and I think Councillor Braithwaite touched on those. One is the context of the, ho the home and the, the potential visual encroachment on Uplands Park, but also the fact that that's a heritage, a national heritage site now. So I, I think the concerns about the interface between the house lot and the park are, are legitimate questions. Um, but I, I will say it was a very positive meeting and, and we had a lot of information from the applicant that was much appreciated. The other issue was dark sky lighting and, and there will be dark sky lighting on, on the site because of course across the road and down a bit is the Urban Star Park. So, so these were some of the elements. So uh, I appreciate um, Councillor Appleton's question. Absolutely, thank you. Are there any other questions of the applicant at this time? No. Oh, go ahead, Councillor Zelka. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, through you uh, to the applicant, it, it, uh, from the plans, it appears to be only one walk out from the basement level. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm also concerned about the blasting and the amount of rock that's being removed from the site. Uh, um, uh, from a windowing perspective or a, or a walk out perspective, um, uh, what's being expected down in the basement? Uh, uh, like, how deep are you going? I, 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 I would love to have some, some, uh, some sense of that, please. Uh, so just can you just be a bit clearer in terms of your question? Um, uh, uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find the uh, the drawing uh, showing the um, the outline of the previous uh, 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 house um, in any of the maps. Um, um, so by by maybe getting a sense of um, of what. Uh, um, uh, a sense of how deep this is going to go, and uh, and I, I can see the usage for the basement, but and I can see one walkout towards the rear, uh, heading towards the um, uh, the Uplands Park. But I just wanted to again, with respect to um, the amount of rock that's going to be removed, um, um, maybe the proponent might be able to supply the uh, the total uh, um, uh, square footage of some sort, or, or the uh, the tonnage of some sort of the rock that's going to be removed. That would help me understand uh, uh, what's going to be happening on the site uh, during the construction. Okay, um, I think we're back to the same question of blasting and, and materials being removed, so I'm not sure we can answer it, but uh, Ms. Bodley, did you want to have a, a crack at that? <laughs> um, what I can say is that I was on the phone for the um, ADP meeting and um, the builder um, went through great detail to explain how the blasting and shoring was going to occur so as to do the minimal impact to the environment around it and to not go beyond the um, footprint itself. So I can't, exp I can't speak to the tonnage and um, I think that that's something that you would explore actually as you excavate because if you're excavating into dirt and you hit rock, then you'll know once you hit it because we don't pre-excavate to figure out where the bedrock begins and ends. Um, but I do know that they're going to extreme measures and we've been working with the arborists um, for months to try to figure out the most 
um, effective way to build the structure in, in its position with retaining as many trees as possible. Um, so I can just say that there's, we've certainly been given a lot of care and thought has gone into both how it'll be excavated and also how we'll be protecting the trees. So that's, I know, maybe just a bit high level, but that's sure. what I can offer. I appreciate that. And I, I think it's worth noting here uh, uh, as well, just we are, we don't normally have things come to our council table unless they're in the uplands because it's a siting and design. Um, our siting and design, well, it's not entirely clear. It's really generally siting and design. So we don't typically get into the blasting portions of that as a, as a criteria for, we're looking at it from the, though it's, it's not that clear, but I just, I want to make sure that when we're at this table as well, we're trying to keep our focus on the, on the primary piece, which is the setting and design. So, but uh, to you, Councillor Zelka again. Uh, thank you, Chair. So um, uh, allow me to uh, drill down just a, a, a hopefully deep enough that, that you'll understand sort of where I'm coming from. From, from a hydrographic or a hyd um, uh, from, from a water and rock uh, uh, situation, I know that some, some of the houses that are near the actual Uplands Park do have some water issues, and I just wanted to confirm that there was no water issues with respect to hitting um, uh, um, uh, underground uh, uh, water table issues or any of those sorts of things that might either be uh, changed or affected uh, by, the, by the blasting. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's this side of the, of the park, but certainly on the other side of the park, there has been some water issue, uh, issues that have come forward that have unfortunately negatively impacted the park. That's, what that, that, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Thank you. Um, I don't know if anybody is able to answer that question uh, in terms of the hydrology of the, of the rock situation Ms. Bodily? Um, through the mayor, um, to my knowledge there's no hydrology issues that have come up um, and certainly in all of the the, um, spe the the meetings with all of the proponents in the building um, in the building process it's never come up in conversation and the site I've been to it probably 20 times right now I've never seen any standing water on it um, I know we're in the middle of summer here but um, yeah I, I, I can't speak to that and I'm not sure that Ted could either but if you can Ted please jump in I'm sorry, I cannot speak on the hydrology. Uh, okay. to give you an informed answer. Thank you, Mr. Levis. Uh, any other questions? I just have one question on this. It's just, uh, it just relates to that um, to the house park interface, and uh, you know, I will say I think I think the house is probably larger than it should be for that interface. However, I also think that we should deal with that from a zoning perspective and not from a, a one-off perspective. However, um, there are ways of mitigating some of that sort of, I know, I know it's, set, it's only one and a half stories up, but still a, it's a large facade looking on that. Is there any ability to add more um, sort of vertical spires of trees along that back boundary uh, in a way that would sort of break up that facade? I know there's a couple of trees that are put planted there, but are there limitations to that siting there that, that, that restrict the number or the types of trees that can be planted to kind of create that, that interface between the parts? It's a large open grassy area, right? So it's a very visible uh, position of that, that particular house on that particular spot. Ms. Bodley? Thank you for the question, um, Mayor. Um, so we did put a lot of thought into that view back to the house. And so what, I, I don't know if you can refer to L6 of the landscape plan. Um, I have a 11 by 17, which is probably not going to I do have anyone. it here, yes. No, that's yeah. good, thank you. So basically we have placed all of the replacement trees, Gary Oaks, along the um, northwest side there. And so that is a very rocky area. I mean, as is much of Uplands Park. So I took this photograph back and then was trying to envision how to create a um, Gary Oak meadow that crosses over that um, that rock interface. So we're planting Gary Oaks, we're creating garden beds for them basically, um, so that they'll have enough soil to be sustainable. And then we'll be under planting it with a Gary Oak meadow mix, um, which will then hopefully just look like a, a smooth transition um, from the park to the house. Um, we are planting um, um, another tree at the in the middle there. Like you can see, it's it's very green on the um, east on the south side, uh, based on the existing foliage there. We'll be pl heavily planting that that edge um, with both tall shrubs and trees. Um, but if we were to plant the trees in the middle of the property, that would take away their access to the park. Um, we could we could add additional trees for sure to that area. And I know the clients love trees and love plant material. And I think you can see from the planting plan, it's extremely dense. And, um, and 
just full of full of beauty really I think it's going to look great from the park um, as far as the landscape goes and we could certainly consider adding an additional tree in the, in the center to break up that view further I, I mean I, I I'm not making it contingent I just think it makes yeah. sense from that perspective um, and probably a mix of, of annuals and perennials as well just because again it's a it's a well-used park year-round mm -hmm. uh, and the coast will be much more exposed in the winter months than it will be in the summer months yes um, um, because there will be, there's lots of people who walk along the trail that, that runs directly behind that house but mm -hmm. I think that that probably deserves a, a, as much effort as possible to mm -hmm. kind of create that that mm -hmm. boundary because I think it will create some overlook on the park and give me more comfort in terms of that yeah. that design if there was sort of more of a barrier between that and the and the park itself. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any other questions? All right, we have the uh, the pro the plans in front of us here. I need a motion to, to speak to go ahead, Councillor Green. I will <coughs> excuse me. I will move the staff recommendation. Moved and seconded. Uh, is there any further discussion on this? I'm not seeing any, so uh, I will call the question then. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? Not opposed? Thank you very much. So the recommendation is to go forward. Um, that doesn't stop you from addi adding additional plantings on that <laughs> space. So, uh, but I certainly appreciate the efforts made there already, and and uh, and wish you all the best of luck with this. Uh, the process here is it go? Oh, sorry, I didn't go to the public. For is there anybody waiting to speak? Okay, phew. <laughs> um, this actually does go back to council for uh, for final approval. So we make a recommendation to council. We're sitting as committee tonight. Uh, for that approval next week. So, Councillor Zelka. Uh, a brief point of procedure. Um, uh, being an, an Uplands property, uh, does notification go to the nearby neighbours or, or has this already been done? It does not. No? No. Okay, it, it gets posted on the site uh, that, that the development process is underway, but there's no notification process under, as part of this. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a nice evening. And thank you, Mr. Levis, from afar. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. We are just going to wait again as we transfer. The next item up is 3060 Midland Road. Uh, and uh, we'll wipe down the counter here. Again, uh, subject to public input, uh, you're welcome to call in at 250-598-3311. Uh, again, 250-598-3311 if there's any public wishes to speak to item number six. Uh, Uplands uh, at 3060 Midland Road. All right, we are, uh, we have the <laughs> applicant. Thank you very much for your patience as you've been waiting through all of this time. Uh, come on in. I'm going to, oh, we've had uh, one of the councillors just uh, step out for a second, so we'll wait for, uh, for them to come back into the room. And as we're waiting, we might as well just get your name for the record here as well. And you can take off your mask when you're at the table. Thank you. Welcome. Ah, good. <laughs> good evening, Mayor and Council. I hope everybody is staying well. My name is Karen Hillel. I'm here um, from Hillel Architecture. And I'm here on behalf of my clients, Julia and Eric Findlay. Thank you and welcome. Uh, we have... Uh, Welcome back, Councillor Braithwaite. We have Ms. Halal here from uh, the design team, architecture team, uh, and Ms. Jensen, I believe you're gonna do a quick over introduction. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Your Worship. Um, this application is also for a new home and also across from Uplands Park, just on the other side. Uh, they're the owner's proposing to replace the existing home, which was built in 1975, with a new 5,900 square foot, two-story home with a d detached garage in the rear. Drawing on French style, materials are consistent between the two buildings, incorporating stucco cladding, brick veneer, and aluminum clad wood windows. This is a smaller lot within the Uplands neighborhood. The applicants are proposing a modest sized home uh, to, and to accommodate the construction, four ornamental trees would be removed, none of which are in particularly good condition. This is supplemented, however, by the addition of 14 new trees. That will result in a 45% tree canopy cover, which meets the requirements of the tree protection bylaw and significantly increases the number of trees on the site from the existing condition. 
The advisory design panel reviewed this application and were generally supportive. They did note that this was a modest sized family home located on a smaller lot and suggested additional measures to improve the elevations and the pilaster and bracket designs. Those suggestions have been incorporated into a revised design, which is in front of council. Staff have reviewed the application with respect to site characteristics and the neighborhood. The home itself is proposed with similar siting to the existing home with the detached garage located to the rear. The siting and design of the project are compliant with both OCP policy and the Upland design guidelines and all zoning bylaw regulations are met. All height and setbacks are adhered to, no variances are required and the introduction of new trees onto the site significantly improves the park like setting and we are looking for council direction. Uh, thank you very much. Ms. Jensen, uh, are there any questions of the applicant or staff on this application? I'm not seeing any. Oh, Councillor Green. If there are no questions, I'm prepared to make a motion. Um, before you make the motion, I'm just going to check with staff to see if there is anybody who've called in on this app on this item. No, Your Worship. Okay, thank you. Then uh, motion is in order. Thank you. I will move the staff recommendation to approve this application. Second. Moved and seconded. Any other discussion? Councillor Zelka. Yeah, I'll ask a, uh, a similar question to the previous uh, proponent with respect to blasting. Uh, what's being proposed for blasting on this uh, uh, site, please? There will be no blasting on this site. Thank you, Ms. Wall. Um, any other questions? Uh, Councillor Appleton. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I, d I just noted in the in the memo from the district arborist that, spe that re species for the planting plan weren't weren't specified. So I was just wondering, are, th are those to be decided, or was there a, a specific plan for species? They've have they've now been specified. Do we know what they are? They are uh, Japanese cherry and magnolia for the large flowering trees. Thank you. They are in keeping with with Oak Bay's list. Thank you, Ms. Law. Uh, any other questions? It's not seeing any. So we have a recommendation to uh, to recommendation to council to approve. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. So this goes to council for final approval next week. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank and you. Thank you for your patience as we've uh, taken our time to get to you tonight. And uh, luckily, it's not a rainy or cold night tonight. So <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, we have the last, the second to last item on the agenda. Sorry. Uh, the heritage alteration permit uh, at 1520 York Place, but we'll just wait uh, for a moment here as we. Good night. Uh, as one applicant leaves and we clean the, the station for the next applicant to come in. Good evening, and for all those watching at home, we are on item number seven, the Heritage Alteration Permit 1520 York Place. Uh, we do have a number of uh, correspondence that has been received uh, as forms part of this application uh, in the amended agenda. And we are, uh, I believe we have the applicant here as well, but if you wish to speak to this particular application, uh, you are most welcome to call in to 250-598. Five three three one one. I keep wanting to give out my own phone number two five zero five nine eight three three one one to call in if you have any uh, any comments or questions. Uh, we welcome that as well. Uh, in the meantime, we have the applicant here, and uh, you're welcome to take off your mask now that you're sitting down, and uh, maybe just give your name for the uh, uh, in relation to this application for the record. Thank you. Uh, and so, can you turn the microphone on uh, when you when you say your name? There we go. Perfect. Brian Morris. Brian Morris. And are you the owner or the uh, builder? I am or the architect. For the, the architect. Owner, yes. Okay. Thank you very much for coming here tonight. My pleasure. And thank you for your patience as we get to these uh, these items. Um, uh, if I may turn to, is it Ms. Jensen that's going to introduce us as well? Um, uh, welcome. Back to Ms. Jensen for this item. 
Uh, thank you, Your Worship. So the heritage alteration permit for this site proposes some modifications to the existing home, which was constructed in 1981. Uh, specifically, the applicant is proposing to replace the existing wooden windows with new wooden windows, installing new wooden doors, removing the chimney, and removing a small portion of the home to create uh, a covered patio space. The roof itself would not be scaled back, but would form the cover for that new outdoor space. The home is located in the Prospect Heritage Conservation Area, but it is a non-protected property that is not on the schedule of properties. So that's the list of properties that are deemed to be protected heritage property. As a property within the HCA, however, a heritage alteration permit is required to undertake the proposed works. The application itself is considered in accordance with uh, Section B of the Prospect Heritage Conservation Guidelines, which sets out considerations for alterations and additions of the non-protected buildings. Those guidelines are used to review the application and are laid out in the staff report on, on page two, I believe, and essentially address respecting the architecture and massing of the home, as well as the use of high quality materials. So having said that, I know this is the first heritage alteration permit coming out of the heritage conservation area. So I wanted to point out a couple of things. Um, hot off the presses and received today, you have a newly updated official community plan, which now includes the heritage conservation area. Um, we've also given you a copy of the conservation guidelines so you can actually see how they interface with this application. So on page three of the staff report, what we've done is actually laid out each of the five guidelines that are contained within section B, and then how the application is reviewed in context with that. Um, I might also point out that for anybody who's watching that the updated OCP and the guidelines are actually available on the district website, so you can easily view them there as well. So if you take a look at page 25, you'll also see how those guidelines are laid out. And that's how the application has been reviewed. So we've looked at, does the, do the proposed revisions meet the architecture of the building? Does it consider the scale and massing of the building? Is it looking at long-term materials uh, to reflect the, the long-term vision of the, of the heritage conservation area? Overall, staff believe the proposed works are minor in nature with respect to the overall character of the home and that there is minimal impact to the streetscape. There is a lot of vegetation along the front of the property, so the proposed works are unlikely to have much impact on the streetscape itself. Uh, at that, if there's any questions, I'm looking for council direction. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Jensen. And I have Councillor Zelka. Did you? Thank you very much, Chair. A question uh, through you to staff. Um, uh, being in a heritage conservation area and, um, and, and having gone through the whole process of, uh, of coming up with this, and I know there was a lot of discussion about process in terms of how would something like this, that when it comes forward, what would happen to it? And, um, and, and of course, since we're in the pandemic, there's changes to maybe some understandings of what the procedures might, might, might be or might, might have been. Um, the, the, the basic question I have through Chair is um, uh, why wouldn't staff or why hasn't staff um, referred this automatically to the Heritage Commission before it comes to this body, please? Ms. Jensen or uh. Mr. Anderson? <laughs> I've got two people reaching for buttons. <laughs> uh. Yeah, just uh, Mr. Anderson might have some additional information and when I finish up here. Um, but essentially, um, Council might recall that we actually came forward to Council in April with a staff report because of the pandemic and how we were going to consider applications and moving them through their own process. Uh, we talked about heritage alteration permits. We talked about development permits, rezonings. Uh, in the end, we had suggested that any minor amendments for a heritage alteration permit could come straight to council for their consideration. Uh, at that point in time, council actually asked us to bring forward every application directly to council, and then council would determine whether they wanted to move it forward to one of the advisory bodies. So you'll see in the, in the options that are outlined in the report uh, that council can consider a decision tonight or you can refer it to the Heritage Commission. Thank you, Councillor Zalko. Uh, are there other questions? I don't know, or comments at this point? I, I'd probably, um, yeah, go ahead. 
Councilor Braithwaite. Um, thank you, um, and thanks for asking that question, Councilor Zelka. And um, I'm glad that that option was um, came up on this recommendation from staff, because because I do feel that, um, and and as most of the correspondence that we have received um, is pointing out that really to complete the circle of the. Um, of what we have set out so far with the HCA, I, I do really feel that this should get re referred to um, the uh, Heritage Commission. Um, I think it's a very thoughtful um, and uh, wonderful um, renovation to this to this house. Um, I'm quite sure that it'll be embraced by the Heritage Commission, but I think that really for transparency and for what we have put in place, it just would. Um, be the the right thing for us to do to, to refer it to the Heritage Commission. That would be how I would feel about it. So when we're ready to make a motion, that would be the motion that I would be putting forward. Uh, thank you, Councilor Bruce. I'm, I'm going to just see if there are any other questions at this point or if there's just comments. Any other questions? Um, I'm just going to ask a question because uh, uh, the, the question I have is, uh, and you may or may not know the answer to this to the proponent or to the, to the applicant, um, what is the timeline? Is are there are there issues here that affect um, like our normally in this process we would refer it to a to the Heritage Commission automatically. It would come through and come to this body in a fairly tight timeline. We're not in that situation right now. We have this sort of staggered approach. What is the timeline for building uh, and the expectations uh, of the owner uh, in terms of getting to work on this? Is there uh, is the, where does it sit in that in that timeline? Uh, well, we applied for the building permit in July, and so the owners at that point were anticipating a permit by a roughly this point in the process. Um, so they, uh, part of the issue with the existing house is the state of the roof and some other disrepairs, and there have been squirrels in the attic. <laughs> Not my attic, but the house attic. <laughs> um, and uh, in fact, when I started working with them, I met them in December, and we didn't start working together until February, March. Um, but in December, they were talking about these issues and how they had had uh, a number of different companies come in to try and deal with the squirrels. And the it has to do with the cedar shake roof and just how the openings are with how the roof was put on originally 40 years ago, and um, it's not the way we do things now, and um, that might be a reason why. So so they are anxious to get going, I guess, would be my comment on their behalf. Uh, and uh, can I just ask, because uh, this is the first time that we've seen you know, a process go into an application, have the, uh, the guidelines mm -hmm. uh, available and, and inform uh, a design process. Uh, can I just ask, <coughs> was that, how did you find the guidelines? Were they fairly clear and, and consistent in, in terms of providing for? I mean, there's a range. This is a newer house. Um, um, did you find that they were actually um, fairly easy to follow and comply with in that process, that design process? Uh, yes, I did, actually. Um, and in fact, I looked at the whole um, uh, document and sort of took, even though ours was just a renovation, I looked at it as, you know, what if it was a new build or that sort of thing and sort of approached uh, the design aspect of it uh, to sort of support the heritage aspect of the uh, neighborhood and the house. I think the house has great potential and I just think what we're doing to it is actually improving it from what it was originally and making it more fit in more with the neighborhood uh, at the end of the day. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's all my questions. So Councillor Green, go ahead. Thank you um, and thank you very much through the mayor for the application and also to staff for um, a very helpful report. And I would agree with councillors Zelka and Braithwaite at this point. I think it's it would be good practice to send this to the Heritage Commission. And the reason I say that is if we do not make this referral as the first HCA referral, I think that would be setting um, a wrong-headed precedent. I think it would be important, particularly in the within the HCA, to continue to utilize uh, the input of the Heritage Commission. And they, I, I know they see themselves as ha having a role in heritage in the community, and I think they were a big part of, of certainly the aspirational process around the HCA, so I would support referring it to them in a timely manner so that the owners are not 
unduly uh, um, held back from their their um, re renovation, but I th I really think it would be good practice to refer to the Heritage Commission for feedback. Thank you. Um, I, if we're just getting into comments here, I think it's worth having a motion on the table so we can talk to the motion and then we can, that, makes, that simplifies our life a little bit instead of talking in generalities. Um, Councillor Braithwaite, you have your light on. So I'll um, make, make the motion that we uh, choose option number three, that the application be referred to the Heritage Commission for further consideration. Second. Okay, thank you. And can I just ask one question from that, that motion? We have a, you know, have to ask the question of what time line are we looking at if that's, if we're asking to reconstitute that, uh, uh, because that, the chambers have to be set up and, the, and a special meeting has to be called for that. So do we have a sense of what timeline that would look like if a special heritage meeting was called? Uh, Your Worship, uh, we do have to manage the safety protocols that still aren't in place for the number of the commission. So we did convene the ADP uh, a, a short time ago uh, with a safety plan in place. Uh, they're only a membership of four, so we will have to look at it from a safety plan perspective as well. Just a, uh, something I'd like to make Council aware of. Thank you. Uh, Council Braithwaite? I, I'm just through you, Chair. Um, is, is Zoom not a, a possibility for a Heritage Commission meeting? Uh, I'll go to staff on that one. Uh, the district doesn't currently have a Zoom account, but we could reestablish that. Again, I'd, I'd have a hard time committing to uh, a day. Uh, staff would operationalize and commit to bring back in the most expedient timeline possible. Okay, thank you for that. That's, that's all we can ask at this point. Yeah. Um, Councillor Braithwaite, did you have anything else? Okay, I have Councillor Green and Councillor Patterson. Through you, Mayor, to staff, what is the quorum requirement for um, the Heritage Commission? How, how many members make up a quorum? Sorry, I'm out of touch with them now. Uh, that would be three. So it would be possible to convene quorum. It's just a thought. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor. And I, you know, I really appreciate the work done by staff. I think they've done a very comprehensive um, evaluation of this application, and I certainly appreciate getting the updated OCP and and the guidelines. Um, and the comments around the table, and, and certainly your comments, Mayor, on on expectations of the applicant, which are which are important. But I think also an important consideration is, um, as this is the first application for the Prospect HCA, um, is it also not at perhaps equally as important? that we have the opportunity to allow this application to go through the process um, and ensure that we have the confidence that the procedure works as intended. Some of your questions, of course, to the, um, the architect indicated the, how, how well the process worked in evaluating it from that end. But uh, just to ensure that we have confidence that the procedure that we have set up um, works as it is intended for protected and non-protected buildings while achieving the community goals to conserve and protect the community heritage in the HCA. Um, and yes, during pandemic now, it's, it's, it's perhaps a, not as expedient for the applicants, but we also all understand around the table just the timeline that was required and all the work um, by not only members of the community, but certainly by the Heritage Commission in, in establishing the HCA. So I think it's also a question of, is it not important to use this opportunity to ensure that uh, we put this through the process and we have confidence that the, what we have, uh, the amendment that we have put in the OCP and the guidelines for it work fully as our expectations were when we approve the process at council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Uh, Councillor Zelka, did I see your hand up? <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, whether it was by telephone, Google Meets, uh, Microsoft Teams, uh, or uh, Passenger Pigeon, I, I would support uh, the motion. Thank you. Councillor Appleton. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, and just for, 
I guess for the sake of completeness of argument, um, I'm going to take an opposing view here, uh, and and I want to respect everything that's been said to this point, and and I, I absolutely concur with. Uh, the idea of being consistent with the HCA guidelines, and, and of course this does have significance because it is the first one. Um, I, I think that we also have a responsibility as, as a council for uh, procedural uh, efficiency and, 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 and uh, conduct of business in a timely fashion. Uh, if this wasn't a project that seemed to be eminently supportable um, and was and is taking place on a on a on a project on a on a property which is not designated or on on a list um so i i, I don't want to prejudice anybody's decision making but you know it, it seems to be an eminently supportable project that would probably present very few uh obstacles um i think we need to recognize that convening the heritage uh commission is is a uh is a, a risk that needs to be managed on behalf of staff. So if it's convened in person, we need to manage the COVID risk. Uh, if it's convened online, then there's a the logistics associated with that. So we are making that collective decision to uh, impose that preparation uh, for this one project, which is not insignificant. Um, and and I, I, I disagree I, I respectfully disagree about the idea that there's that this could potentially set a precedent um, I think everybody recognizes we're in COVID times here I think that everybody recognizes their pro processes are not what they would normally be um, so I, I think that at the same time as we want to respect the intent of the HCA uh, and and the procedure that's contained within and I absolutely understand that and I would say to the people that wrote to ask us about that and the people who conveyed that I, I, I hear you, and I and I respect that, and I understand that very much. Uh, I, I think that we also collectively have an obligation to to act uh, in response to the, the COVID situation that we're in. Um, so, uh, on balance of factors, I think that there is a reasonable way to to move forward uh, with this right now. I don't disagree with the with the reference, but I think we can move it faster if we just uh, move forward with another option. But um, that's just my view on it. Uh, thank you, Councillor Appleton. Uh, Councillor Green, for second time. Just a quick remark. Um, in response to Councillor Appleton, thank you for your comments. Um, but the staff report did provide option three, so I, I appreciate that, you know, the staff recognized that that was an option, and, um, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Green. Any other comments? So, Counts uh, Ms. Varela? Oh, thank you very much. I was not aware, so thank you for that. Um, I'm happy to let the uh, member of the public come and speak. This is a little awkward. How do we actually manage this dance? Uh, does the applicant have to stand up and go to the different chair? Yeah, could I move you back yep. to this chair, sir, and then let's the Thank you for, <laughs> for your patience in this. We we all appreciate the other duties as as a, as a, as assigned in your contract, Bruce. This is uh, yeah. Hello and welcome. You may have a seat if you. Oh well. If you just state your name and municipality residence for the record, then uh, you feel free to speak to the to the uh, item Wine on Wines. the agenda. Um, good evening. I'm Sharman Minus. I live in Oak Bay, and it's um, nice to be back in the chambers. Um, I've been sitting out there since quarter to seven, and I probably don't need to say this speech because it's pretty much like the letters you've had, although you didn't have a letter from me. But I'm going to say it because I sat there that long. It's my time to shine. Okay, good evening. Thank you for letting me speak tonight. And special thanks to, to the staff who are having to deal with all these extra duties. I mean, they're doing an amazing job in a very difficult time. Um, I'm going to speak. I, I think the um, replacement of the windows at 1520 York Place and all the other renovations 
very sympathetic, um, fits into the aesthetic of the neighborhood, and there's nothing wrong with it at all. I think it would be an, an easy yes, but it is about the process for us. Um, perhaps after four years of, of um, working to get this finished, to get the um, Prospect Place HCA in place, we went through... Uh, all the residents were involved. We went through two councils. Maybe we wore the first one out. I don't know. And, um, and also outside experts. Um, we have to get this right. We have to, and we set on this road, and we, we learned a lot. I think we all learned a lot. And we have to take procedures, and we have to get this right. So um, uh, what I was going to say was that um, on your Thursday meeting, you're, you're talking about the procedures of HAPS just generally in Oak Bay and uh, saying that they should be referred to the Heritage Commission. So, I mean, and I've just heard you all say that, yes, you believe that that should be done. I don't think we should use COVID as an excuse, respectfully, um, to not do our duty. As you can see, the staff has coped um, to present meetings and, and, they're, and they're doing things. I'm not sure of procedures that if it ha does it have to be sort of a face-to-face -face online type of meeting? Could it be... Um, uh, an email exchange that is then, you know, publicly shown to you or something like that between the various commission members. I, I don't know how, how those things work. Um, but this is, um, you basically curtailed my speech because you brought up all the points. But I, I would respectfully urge council to vote for option three on this uh, um, item. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Minus, and thanks for hanging out with us in our very comfortable chairs in the lobby. If I may add, life is so boring now. Like, <laughs> this, is ex <laughs> this is the highlight of my week. Great. We're, the, we're the Netflix of people. Yeah, that's great. Um, I, so thank you very much for coming. And I, I will, as we wipe down the station again, I don't know I don't know if we have to move you back up here again if there's no other questions uh, for the applicant. But... Um, uh, I'm just going to ask staff, are there any phone calls uh, that have come in on this item? Your Worship, there are none. Okay. So we're back at this table. There is a, uh, a motion here on the table. Is there any other discussion on this on this one item? I will... Uh, nope, oh, sorry. I keep seeing things out of the corner of my eye. It's been a while since I've been here. The, um, the only thing I would, I would add uh, my two cents to this. I, I think the arguments made on, on all sides of this are, are really appreciated. I think that... You know, my personal take on this one is almost everybody prefaces this with an it's an easy yes because the the work done to in the by the architect and by the uh, in abidance with the guidelines that are there. Um, to me, that's sort of the trigger point for me. If we're trying to be uh, effective and efficient, um, I don't see a, setting things off to either a committee for input where that that isn't especially in a non heritage. Um, it's a non-heritage scheduled property, so we're looking at this more from a general aesthetics perspective and and uh, I'll work on the back of a house that's well, sh well shielded, uh, that's clearly sympathetic. I have a hard time adding work just for the sake of, of, of being seen to do the right thing when we can actually just make the decision, I think, that's very clearly the right decision. Um, so to me, I think the age of the home, 1981, the location of the changes at the back of the home, the clear attention to detail in terms of the wooden windows and all the sort of specifics attached to that that are the heritage best practices, even though it's not a heritage home. Um, uh, and I think uh, my, my own bias on this one is w it's easy to remember all of the people who were very supportive of the heritage uh, conservation area. Um, but the other flip side of that is a lot of people were very nervous about the the possible negative impacts of this, the timelines it would take, any additional bureaucracy it would add. And so I'm sort of cognizant of that piece as well, if you want to see more of these come into place. I don't have any great objection. I think we can manage this in a in a fairly timely fashion, but I have a hard time supporting this this referral just because I think in this case it's so obvious and, uh, and it adds uh, work and time in a mechanism that doesn't necessarily benefit from it. If there were some other items on the heritage uh, agenda, I would probably jump at the chance, but to call a special one for this one item, I have a harder time with. But I do appreciate uh, both the positive and the negatives that have raised here. I think they covered all the aspects of the uh, of this particular uh, piece. So um, any other comments for this? The motion is to refer to the heritage conservation and uh, and all that entails. Oh, sorry, heritage, sorry, what did I say? Heritage <laughs> Commission, that's late, obviously. Uh, seeing none, so all those in favor? And opposed? Councillor Appleton, I'll vote opposed as well. Um, that, that's carry, and so that will go to the Heritage Commission, then come back to 
uh, a future council meeting. I take it that's the, the process, not back to Committee of the Whole. Uh, is that correct, staff? I believe this would, would direct itself back to Committee of the Whole, not a council meeting. Okay. Um, can we can we direct that to come back to the to a future council meeting? I don't know that it needs to come back to the committee of the whole for additional public input. We've had that once. We're just getting the the heritage commission piece, or is that not viable? Uh, I think, as it was noted, your worship, we are in uh, interesting times, <laughs> and so I think uh, uh, we can probably accommodate if if the wish of council is that this goes directly to council. I'm also uh, hopeful and presuming that we might have a new council's procedures bylaw in place by the time <laughs> this uh, this comes forward. So with that, I think it's uh, perhaps council's direction. Okay, so that. at this point, it's going to come back to future committee of the whole. If so, if council wishes it to come directly to council, then we need a quick motion to that effect to, to direct it to come back to council. Mr. Council Braithwaite? I'll, I'll make that motion that it come back to council. Second. I'll second. Moved and seconded. Any other discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed, not opposed. So it'll go in expedient a fashion as possible to the uh, Heritage Commission and then immediately back to the following uh, um, council meeting uh, following that. So well, hopefully we'll get through this process reasonably quickly. Uh, and, uh, and I hope there's some wisdom that comes from that table that will benefit. There's a lot of knowledge at that table that, that might be able to benefit and provide suggestions as well. But um, uh, look forward to that as well. So thank you very much. So that motion has passed. Uh, thank you very much for coming out tonight. All right, thank you. Have a great evening. And we have one last item on the agenda that does not require any wiping down, I don't think, unless Mr. Haran is joining us in the room. He's not. Okay, so uh, with that, item number eight, we have a verbal update from the Director of Engineering and Public Works on the um, uh, building and building and, uh, Director of Building and Planning on the challenges and successes with patio extensions. And this was something that was uh, delegated to the Emergency Operations Center in many ways to say, please do what you can uh, to help with our business community. Uh, and part of that was the uh, establishment of patios throughout the community. So, um, uh, Mr. Anderson, are you going to lead this or should it be Mr. Haran? Uh, Your Worship, I believe uh, Mr. Haran was going to kick us off on the, uh, the public uh, patio portion. Okay, and I'm, I apologize for cutting short after your long wait, Mr. Haran, but it is 10.25. We normally stop at 10.30. Um, we can go past that if we have to, but we're just trying to probably do a quick verbal update, take some questions, uh, and uh, this is a chance just to give an update on how things have gone. Welcome back, Mr. Haran. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so uh, what I was going to start with is that uh, in late May, uh, Council authorized me to issue street occupancy permits for the purposes of temporary sidewalk uh, or public parking stall patios um, to expand uh, the footprint of uh, certain types of businesses, uh, and that application fees and administration fees for these be waived, uh, and that these measures remain in place until uh, November 15, 2020. Um, so there was a lot of interest initially, uh, and in uh, response to this, uh, staff developed guidelines for these purposes, uh, requiring business owners to submit uh, accurately drawn plans showing the patio areas, the entrances, curb lines, and other structures that might uh, impede or, or be uh, a part of the application. Uh, confirm zoning and licensing for restaurant use, uh, and then we provided guidelines such as things like ensuring that uh, uh, pedestrian pathways are, are remain two meters wide, um, that the patios or proposed patios were enclosed uh, with barriers, and, and a number of other um, uh, safety and, and uh, look and feel requirements. Uh, so the challenges that we experienced was a lot of initial uh, interest in the idea, um, but the challenges that we faced were there's a lot of narrow sidewalks and minimal public space available to do uh, to do uh, what people had in mind. Um, as you see in Oak Bay Village, uh, you know, parking stalls, public parking stalls were required to expand uh, and, and accommodate the requests. Um, so some businesses like Penny Farthing, Vis-a-Vis, -vis, and Rogers Chocolates, all with the same owner, uh, could create larger patios, uh, but others with smaller frontages needed the consent of uh, neighboring businesses to expand these parking stalls um, and these, uh, this consent was typically not given. Um, so um, the other aspect of the challenge is the patios and the measures to separate pedestrians from the traffic. Uh, was requ the requirement was that this was done at business owners' expense, uh, so they required expertise in construction uh, and design uh, and also the money required to, to support this. So in the end, uh, there was several uh, discussions with multiple business owners, but two, uh, that finished the process, so that would be uh, Ruth and Dean in the village, uh, SMM Village, 
um, showing the use, an example of the use of public space um, in terms of sidewalks, and then penny farthing and vis a vis showing the use of uh, public parking for patio expansions. Uh, so I have four others that uh, discussions are ongoing, and there's a few that are still ongoing, uh, but a couple of uh, longer-term um, uh, roadblocks, that's a bad example, a bad use, a bad use of a term, uh, snags that we have to resolve before we can move forward. So that's my verbal update on the use of public space. Uh, happy to answer any questions. I think Mr. Anderson had some private property um, feedback to give as well. Uh, Mr. Anderson? Um, yeah, I just uh, wanted to note that in terms of uh, uh, patios proposed on private properties, we actually uh, did sort of adapt a, an existing process we have in place for us to consider those, and we have uh, four that had gone through the process on that. And we're basically putting a condition on a business license, uh, similar process, but really just dealing with uh, on-site issues. And there uh, hasn't been the issue, that as, as Dan had mentioned, regarding uh, the pedestrian uh, access piece or of course the issues around uh, use of parking spaces so on the private patio side a little bit simpler a little bit more straightforward and and uh, of the uh, four that uh, proceeded uh, or four that came in uh, they proceeded with with their their patios on that and we do have uh, and those are temporary if I may uh, respecting the the COVID time frame uh, but we also have uh, an interest in looking at some uh, winter associated patio and staging customer staging i just thought i would mention that as well so i think i'll leave it with that thank you uh, thank you and i just we have one minute left so if there's any questions i need a motion first to just extend us with another 10 I'll minutes i'll make a motion to extend the meeting for 10 minutes second moved and seconded thank you uh, council Braithwaite, did you have another no oh, that was it council green oh councillor Patter green and then patterson yes oh. Oh, sorry. Yes, we have to vote on that. It has to be unanimous. All those in favor? Opposed? Not opposed. Thank you. Whew. I'll get this job down eventually. Uh, Councillor Green? Just very quickly through you to staff. I understand that, um, that Dr. Bonnie closed bars or announced that they were closing bars and banquet halls um, now in view of increasing numbers. So I just, my, my question was, are there any impacts for Oak Bay and for our, our small businesses here? Thank you very much. Mr. Anderson, I don't believe we have any nightclubs or, or halls, I think, that qualify, but do you know? Mr. Anderson, are you aware yeah, of? I, yeah, I don't, I don't believe we'd, we'd have that category uh, in, in Oak Bay. It, it's the, the, the penny farthing, I think, would be the primary. That yeah, that's why I asked the question. I wasn't sure how the penny farthing was categorized. Thank you. Yeah, it is. It is a, a restaurant um, category. Councilor Patterson. Yes, thank you, Mayor, and um, through you to staff. Uh, one of the questions I've been asked by by residents who are, of course, questioning some of the, the use of public space. Although I think generally the comments have been. Uh, there have been more positive than negative, um, but uh, the the save for the penny farthing, the fencing, or um, you know some of the temporary installations that go up, those costs are all borne by the um, the operators of the businesses, are they? Mr. Anderson. Yes. Oh. Any other questions, uh, Councillor Appleton, and then back to Green. Uh, thank you, Worship, and, and through you to staff. I, I just wanted to pick up on something that the Director of Engineering uh, mentioned in that, and, and that was brought up a couple of times through this process, was that for a given business to seek access to you know, the public space, the public parking space in front of their business, that they were asked to, to seek permission or, or to seek the approval of adjacent business owners. And I was just wondering... I guess, not to put staff on the spot, but I'm just wondering where that requirement comes from. Given the fact that it is public space, uh, I was just, I, I, I can definitely understand it from a courtesy point of view, uh, but as, as you might expect that the, the answer would often be negative based on perceptions of how much that parking area might get used, I'm just wondering whether or not there, you know, a, an, al an alternative approach could be uh, evaluated or, or if I guess what I would, th that's not meant to be a criticism of staff. I meant I'm more putting it from the point of view of would it be of assistance to staff if council provided more parameters for the uh, conditions under which 
uh, somebody could petition for the use of that space and, and the role that adjacent business owners might might have, I guess is a better way of putting that. Uh, go to Mr. Anderson probably to answer that question. Uh, over to Mr. Horan. Or Mr. Horan. Uh, oh, right. Yes, thank you. I'd be happy to, to try to address that. Uh, I think um, in the short term, so during uh, the, the EOC being in full operations and, and you know, uh, a lot has changed even in three months in terms of how businesses are operating. We really were leaning towards um, being as, as nimble as possible and trying to, uh, to enable businesses to reopen um, as effectively as we could. Uh, so um, the, the downside is that there wasn't a lot of time to consult or develop uh, or even seek further counsel direction around um, you know, issues that, were, that we learned through the summer that we didn't necessarily anticipate. So for this question about which part of the public space should be allocated for these kinds of uh, um, uh, uses, I think for more permanent solutions, if there were to be some, we would definitely need to ask council for some direction on how um, how the council would like to see that happen in the future. Uh, but for the summer, uh, in terms of this temporary um, solution, it was uh, at the staff level to make a judgment call to say, um, you know, this is the, the space that's available and, and, and to consult with your neighbors to try to come up with uh, uh, something that worked. Uh, I hope that answers the question. And, uh, yeah, go ahead, Councillor Appleton. Uh, th thank you, Worship, and just as and that's and that's great, and I appreciate that. So I guess um, uh, hoping for the best, but planning for the worst. If we come out the other side of, if we arrive at late spring 2021, and we're still faced with similar restrictions on what we what businesses are able to do, then yeah, I would I would love to have that conversation with staff to have staff bring back some options and and say. Uh, we're dealing with the same thing as summer 2020, and so what uh, more parameters and what more detail can we offer uh, business owners in, in that kind of situation? So, Ms. Varela? Mm -hmm. uh, just for the benefit of people who may be watching at home, so the practice has been that businesses have access to the parking in front of their business frontage. If they propose to expand the use into adjacent parking spaces in front of other businesses, that's when consultation with those adjacent businesses was requested. So that's been the practice. I'm not sure if Mr. Haran wants to add to that or not. Oh, your worship, that, uh, that captures exactly what, uh, what the practice has been definitely since, uh, since the beginning, uh, in, since, uh, since May. Okay, thank you very much, Steph. Uh, any other Questions, Councillor Green and then Braithwaite. Sorry, I don't think I've gone to Braithwaite yet, so go ahead. Thank you. Um, just uh, I, Dr. you, Chair, I, um, I think I heard Mr. Anderson mention something about uh, uh, expansion of this perhaps into winter months, and I'm just wondering if you could expand on that. Mr. Anderson? So uh, it's actually a, a new business that's asking us to look at um, the opportunity for some covered um, patio and some covered uh, staging for customers uh, waiting for for takeout so it's not one of the existing patio um, approvals that we've given it's actually a, a new one that's but it is one that's coming in it's asking for uh, a winter time frame uh, primarily to provide for some protection around that and so it's we would take I think a similar approach and and have a temporary approval uh, process in place and allow that for uh, over the winter months Thank you. Yes, so just, just to follow up, so that to me would mean that if there was something that was existing that might want to um, expand into the winter months as well, um, that that would come to council for uh, a, an, a, a permission to expand into like October, November, December or something like that? I believe right now we're limited by the province's regulations ending on October 20, 31st. Um, so I think if the province changes that, then that would probably come back for consideration by council at that point. Is that correct, Ms. Rella? Yes, it is. Okay, thank, thank you. That makes yes, sense. Yes, it is, yeah. Your Worship. So that was, I believe, in October 31st. Uh, we had extended it slightly into November to allow the businesses to remove their patios unless uh, regulation changes. So unless staff wants to add something to that. Okay, the only thing I you. wanted to add, if I may, Your Worship, is that um, the, the, the 31st date was associated with the... the uh, Temporary expansion of liquor license areas, yes. and so that's what's that that's tied to. So there may be a scenario where there isn't a liquor license involved. So I'm just 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Green? Yeah, I, I just wanted to make some comments, and, and I really want to commend staff um, as liaison to the BIA and to the Tourism, Com um, Tourism Committee, both of which those sectors have taken a really significant hard hit with the pandemic. I'm really impressed by how staff um, worked so hard with all the local businesses. Um, and also, um, recently, the farm, our small farm market on at the Municipal Hall has been really well received. So I have a lot of residents talking about how much they appreciate the, you know, the patio experience on the avenue and so on. So thank you to staff, really and truly. And also the work that engineering has done, um, that Bruce and his department has done, and also public works when they have to set up for the farm market every, sun every other Sunday or whatever it is now. Anyway, thank you all. Uh, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Good timing. It's a nice way to end it. Thank you, Councillor Green. I uh, extend our, that appreciation on behalf of all the council uh, and the public. Uh, we've had a lot of positive mm -hmm. comments, and I know we haven't been able to accommodate everybody. And uh, you know, there's always you know those those frictions about things like you know uh, a narrow storefront and having access to to things. So lessons learned, and I really appreciate the update that was provided here tonight. Um, I don't think we need a motion to receive its committee of the whole, so it's just a verbal update. Um, so at this point, I think we're ready to go to a motion to adjourn. Move adjournment. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed, not opposed. Thank you very much. And uh, we will see you all in two days at the uh, special committee of the whole uh, for the procedures bylaw. So 7 o'clock on Thursday. For anybody watching at home, it's 7 o'clock on Thursday. Thank you very much. Have a good night.